started feeling really, really sick. sick. <laughs> and, 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 and then right, right now, now it's about Thursday, I think. I was just in a... Yeah, I've just had a look at that. I think that might be fixed now. Hopefully, fingers crossed. They'll let us know. I've got I've got meter levels and stuff going on here, so it, it's uh, uh, got audio now, but it's echoey. That's weird. Oh no! Oh, no! Oh no! Okay. Oh, I know why. Because of that. Because this idiot, this idiot here. I'm, I'm, I've got Ben on the screen at the moment when I'm saying it. This idiot <laughs> was playing around with things earlier and and messed up big time. Should we start again? I mean, we can't edit this, but we'll say, hello everyone. It's the ProSynth Network live show. It's uh, on Sunday, October 25th. It's now five past eight. Um, this idiot messed up and you lost audio for a while there. Um, so I, I apologize. Um, that's all I can do. As Ben cracks open another tinny, don't get it on the laptop. Why don't you pour it in a glass, mate? Look at him. Look at him supping it from the top of the lid there. Honestly. Too common. Too common Too for that common. kind of stuff. Put it in a glass. Drinking that. Can, on, all the germs on the top of the <laughs> can. Yeah. Oh, hey, it doesn't do me any harm. I've spent, I've spent the past week in bed. Isn't well, it? yeah, you spent the... Probably, <laughs> probably because the cans you drank from last week were smothered in someone's excrement. Oh, yeah. oh joy. I used to work in the supermarket back in the in the eighties, and oh, some of the stuff you see, and you think, oh, we put that out on the shelf. Yeah, we'll have a laugh about that. Oh, yes. Anyway, um, that's not making me feel very. <laughs> Honestly, the stories very I heard. Advertised. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, okay. listen, we're here to talk not about bugs and dropping Guinness on your laptops and stuff. We're here to talk about all things kind of music technology. We have a very special guest with us to do that this week. Um, it's Mr. Andrew Brooks, um, the synthesizer's own world, uh, own version of Martin Lewis, the money-saving expert. Because um, I, I don't know, I think you look <laughs> like him. Don't, ben, you. so Chris doesn't know who Martin Lewis is. Um, yeah, but yeah, do you, does, don't you does. think he looks yeah. like... Martin yeah. Lewis, who yeah. saves us loads of pounds. Sheffield's own Martin Lewis. God. Well, I need to take some tips from him because I'm absolutely <laughs> hopeless at saving money. <laughs> I, 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 I have no idea about, about that at all. Money slips through my fingers like yeah, water. Tell me about it. So, so for those that don't I did, know... Oh, go I on. did hear that, that Martin Lewis, uh, they, they put something out. If you've, been, if you've been forced to work from home by your employer, uh, you can actually get six pounds a day. Yeah. Uh, tax relief for that yeah. um, for every, every yeah so every day so I'm, I'm looking back at that so it must have been about a hundred days yeah so I must I must be do about six hundred quid in yeah. tax relief oh Go cool I should have to do something about that so yeah, but other than that, that that's that's the only thing that Martin Lewis and I are having in common <laughs> but, uh, and thank you thank just you just to clear it up for all all our non UK based uh, viewers Martin Lewis is a very famous man over here he's called the money saving expert and he had this website or still has this website and he's on TV and he is just this massive consumer champion um, and he's, he's a bit of a ledge uh, in 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 the UK. He's, uh, and and go and look him up on Google, and then have a look at Andrew and tell me if I'm wrong. That's all I say. Anyway, Andrew, how are you, sir? I'm I'm fine. I've recovered now from my uh, start of half term ailments. I mean, last Saturday when I was on Ranzi's show, I had next to no voice and was croaking away. Right. Uh, but I seem to have got over that. But in the meantime, I've I've done my knee in carrying a load of crap up and down the, the stairs. To go to the dump it site, and it's really giving me jip. It's rubbish. This getting old business. <laughs> Tell it me really, about really, it. really is oh, terrible. Yeah. Well, that's three of you. So hopefully, I'm, I'm going to avoid any ailments over the next coming <laughs> week because uh, I seem to be the old one out at the moment. But it's great to have you, mate. Um, because obviously, yeah, people will Thank know you. you from from Rand's show and other places around yeah. the internet. Um, so we thought, well, we we've got to get this guy on our show. Um, so just tell oh, us. Well, thank thank you for asking me. No, I mean I think it's a real compliment. Before uh, we kind I, of. Get, oh, go on. Sorry, go on. I keep interrupting. No, I was just all right because you know, as uh, as you are called in your name, the Pro Synth Network. I, I'm I'm not a pro. I'm I'm anything but. I, I'm a I'm a rank amateur. I think uh, and, and, an enthusiast who, who who does it because he enjoys it. All, all pretensions of professionalism went out the window years ago. <laughs> I wanted to once, but now I just do it because I enjoy it. And, I, and I'd, yeah. I'd love to get back into it. It's a, it's a more a sort of professional level. I mean, part of my plan for this year was to go out and get get loads of gigs. Mm -hmm. 
and of course that's fallen flat on its face. So, yeah. you know, in in the meantime, well, we'll see what happens when all this this silly pandemic thing is over, if it's ever over. If it's ever over, so. indeed. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's not looking great, is it? Let's be honest. But listen, tell us a little bit about yourself. Nothing too, you know, we don't have to go into huge amounts of detail, but tell us, you know, what you do, what's your involvement in music technology? Because I know you're a teacher, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So what what, yeah, do you, I, what do you teach? Who do you teach? Who do I teach? I teach uh, 11 to 18-year-olds in a, in a secondary school in Nottinghamshire. I teach modern languages. I, I don't teach music, although I have had things to do with uh, music technology in the music department they have asked me to do sort of little seminars on on analog synthesis in the past and things like that and i've done a couple of little gigs at school um but I'm, my, my involvement with, with it all goes way back into my into my teens when a, a friend of mine brought round a uh, a tape. You know, I'm sick of listening to classical music at your house, Brooksy. Let's listen to this. And he put a t- <laughs> he put a t- he put a tape on, and it, 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 he called it Six of the Best," which made me laugh anyway. And it was six uh, Ultravox songs oh, that he right. put on the tape. And and I was just like, "This sounds fantastic. This sounds really." The, the first track was was the voice, mm-hmm. and the next the next track was the Thin Wall. And I'm going, "Oh, this is amazing. I remember Ultravox. They did they did that Vienna song, didn't they?" <laughs> So I really got oh synthesizers yeah they've got keyboards I can play those I'm a pianist I can play that sort of thing. so I really got into it and from, and from that point on uh, a sort of path was was set really um, so I got I got very very much into it and uh, and then I got I got very much into the sort of house and techno scene in the in the late eighties early nineties I arrived in Sheffield and and got involved in the, in in that scene here in Sheffield and. And did loads and loads of of live live gigs playing what I called my, my take on 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 techno and house trance that sort of thing um, with a a W30 sampler an SH101 a Pro One uh, an old Boss drum machine a Mackie mixer and just taking it all out setting it up on a stage all run off an Atari ST mm-hmm. and and that that was what I I did and I and I loved it and loved it I I, I then got involved with a little collective. Um, Two other guys. Uh, one of whom is actually again quite well known in the in the music the music world these days. His name's Professor Rupert Till. He's mm. the the head of um, music technology at Huddersfield University. Uh, but Rupert, myself, and a fellow called Tom Howard, we 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 sort of job, formed a little band called Chillage People, and we used to go and set up our gear in chill out rooms in in clubs and and sort of semi improvise for two hours and stuff and eventually we thought we'll, we'll put an album together so we, we pulled all our resources into into rupert's attic studio and and re- spent a year recording an album which uh, was was a great learning experience shortly after that uh, i i i was very unwell and, and just everything went to pot I, I lost the plot with all sorts of things and, and got very much out of the, the music scene and it took me a long time to sort of get back into it. And I got sort of, you know, feeling my way again around sort of 2014, 2015 and, and realized with horror that the world had moved on an absolute <laughs> pace. And apart from the fact that a load of my gear, which had been stuffed up in a corner whilst I unceremoniously chain smoked over it, a lot of it didn't work anymore, which was, you know, like I've got the old pro one back there, which is in a really parlous state. And, but, it didn't stop me wanting to get get going again, so I started to get back involved and and just just by chance, I suppose, Ramsey put out a, a sort of an appeal at the end of sort of one of his shows, saying we're going to be short of guests next week. If anybody wants to come on, why not? So I thought, well, all right, in for a penny, in for a pound, I'll <laughs> I'll sort of do it, and and, and it's been great. And I'm very grateful to Ramsey for giving us that opportunity, and, I, and I've loved I've loved doing it, you know, mm. and it's it. I was I was talking to Chris yesterday. He helped me out with it with the Skype thing, and he, we we were saying, weren't we, Chris? That it, it, it's a it's a sort of technological miracle that we can, I can be in Sheffield, Chris can be in California, Ken is in. Did he say Ken Flux is in Delaware, Delaware and Ramsey's yeah. in? You know, it's like here we are, all around the world, and we're brought together on these little screens and talk. Mm. I find it I find it amazing. It really it sort of boggles my mind a little bit still. <laughs> it, it's been a it's been a real sort of eye-opener that there is this community uh, out there across the world who are willing to to sit and chat and share ideas agree disagree fall out sometimes you know in, in all the usual ways it's been great I, I, i've loved it you know Good. and yeah. then also there's 
there's there's the lovely Mr. Inverted Popes who's in, who's been in the chat uh, who needs to keep bullying me about getting more stuff out because <laughs> I have I, I I find it very hard to keep that that thing going. I and mean, I, I love noodling about, but actually finishing things is a bit of a proper bore lane yeah. for me. Well, it's a common a common ailment I think of all of us. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, that's cool. That's that's a nice little bit of background. Some things I didn't even know there. So, um, welcome. Thank you ever so much for joining us. And oh, pleasure. Um, Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. We look forward to your your um, contribution, which, given your previous record, I'm sure will be absolutely fantastic. So, let's um, <laughs> let's crack on. You say the nicest we? things, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we've got a whole bunch of of news topics to discuss. We've also got the uh, the poll topic that I. I Hands up! I apologise. It was late this week, but you know, guys, thank and girls, um, thank you ever so much for your involvement in that because we've had a, a really fantastic response to that poll, and it's going to give us something nice and juicy to get our uh, our teeth into um, a little bit later on when we discuss um, that that poll subject was, but which was basically the 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 question I posed was, uh, in your opinion, which synthesizer? Changed the game in terms of either sound process or inter interface design. So one or all of those uh, doesn't have to be. Um, and you know, I put my suggestions in there, and lots of other people put theirs in, and lots of valid reasons and a few invalid ones um, as to to why that they should be in there. So we'll discuss the results of that poll um, a little bit later on. But first of all. Um, I guess well, let's get on with some uh, some of this week's news. Um, so first up, um, probably the most um, I don't know underwhelming um, reveal of this week. It, they've been teasing it for ages. It's the Novation AFX station. This is a, uh, a supposed collaboration with uh, Richard D. James, a uh, aka AFX Twin. Um, although there are some reports that he had literally nothing to do with it. There are also some reports, which um, I will bring up later, um, about uh, an, a former intern uh, that did an internship at Novation, said about seven or eight years ago, I presented this very kind of design to them, and Novation said, no, nah, that's no, we don't like that. And they went with the regular kind of base station two design that we, we are familiar with today. Um, so there's a little bit of kind of um, animosity around this, and I think it's, uh, I don't know, it seems to have not really excited very many people. So who wants first dibs at, um, at the AFX station? Anyone? I'll go in first, if you like, go because on you basically wiped out everything I was going to say with you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, say it again in a more interesting way. Oh, it's fine. Uh, I think, well... It is very underwhelming, isn't it? Because it's basically just a paint job because all this AFX engine or whatever it's called, it, that, that's that been with the base station for quite some time now, hasn't it? The base station 2's had that yeah. functionality for a while. Mm -hmm. So so the selling it on that, that's its biggest selling point. But really, the, there is nothing new there apart from... Apart from the the change of looks, yeah, and uh, and I read about uh, the, the guy um, Finley Finley Shakespeare, it? Finley Shakespeare of Future Future Sound, wasn't it? Um, <coughs> yeah, Future Sound Systems. Yeah, he, he claims that he he created it, uh, and and you keep hearing reports that uh, Richard didn't have much to do with the actual development of it. It's just like a licensing of his name. Yeah. So that does. It does kind of ring true a little bit in that respect. You will always get somebody who said, oh, "I thought of that. That was me." But I think, uh, I think there might be some tiny amount of truth in that one. I don't, you know. Yeah. So, so, so this is the dodgy. this is the thing here that um, our friend Robin Vincent uh, put up on his Gear News website, which I must say, GearNews dot com um, is becoming uh, a place where mm. I'm getting lots of good information because it, because it's Robin. It's a good sign. It, yeah, it's it's solid um, and it's trustworthy, uh, which is you know something we don't get in the news very much these days. But yeah, Finley Shakespeare of Future Sound Systems suggests that he actually came up with the patch switching idea while he was on a placement with Novation from his university course during the development of the BS2. Um, he says he also dressed one up in similar knobs when it was in pre-production and Novation hated it. Um, however, 
um, he you know he posted a series of tweets um, discussing this, and then uh, Novation responded. Apparently, there is no bad blood, and it was a genuine case of great minds think alike. Um, but his 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 closing remark, I thought, was very apt. He said, "I'd still like to point out this uh, this is a case that junior engineers should be listened to, uh, and abso absolutely right too." Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's really kind of like, oh, is that it? Because we were kind of expecting something a little bit more fun and interesting. And what you thought, Chris? Um, are you a base station user, or does this excite you in any way? Or are you with the rest of us? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't look pretty much with the rest of you. I think uh, I have a pretty dispassioned view about it. When, so when the base station came out, I don't know, when, when about was that? 2000s or um, does anybody know? the original base station yeah Ooh, yeah late 90s, late 90s wasn't it? yeah yeah it was 90s early, early than okay that. and then base station two yeah was, it's... yeah that's what seven eight years ago yeah it, it's fairly recent mm. yeah, not... yeah yeah i mean that that stuff just wasn't on my radar uh so for the last whatever i had you know, I had some hardware, like an old Juno and stuff, but then mainly I was using in the box stuff for quite a while until I got into hardware since. So this kind of era of synthesizer of the base station, base station two, I just don't have any experience with the micro -Korg. I mean, I've, I've played a couple of them, but they just didn't compare to what's out now. It hadn't been, uh, uh, really any, anything that was on my radar, mm -hmm. but just watching the reaction of, um, people to this has been kind of interesting. It seems to have fallen a bit short of maybe what Novation thought. But now, you know, to give Novation some credit, they've had a, a number of really great synthesizers or, you know, the Summit is really fantastic. And I, oh, yeah. I would guess that the Peak is also. Mm -hmm. So um, they've, they've definitely had their share of hits. Maybe uh, this rebranding of a, of a synthesizer wasn't the the hit they wanted but uh we know that they'll be back with something good yeah sure. oh you know sasquatch says uh chris a bass player talking about bass station too yeah i don't i don't use a <laughs> lot of synth bass i do i have i am trying to use it more just because it is a different flavor but yeah i would uh, i would always go first to a bass guitar but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so i think i think the afx idea when i heard that was announced you know for the original bass station two I thought that was a brilliant idea, the way that you can have a, a different sound on every key. It's, mm. a, it's amazing. And it's not, I shouldn't imagine it's not that difficult to do. You know, it's, it, mm. it is, I, 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 I presume it's some sort of like fast patch switching thing, you know, because it's monophonic. Yeah. I, I guess that's how it works. But that's a really good idea. But like I said earlier, that's that's been going a while now. There's nothing actually new on this thing apart from the, the, it's the Emperor's new clones, isn't it? Does it does have a whiff of that about it? What do you think, yeah. Andrew? Well, in terms of whiff of new clothes, the Novation aren't the first company to put new clothes on since recently, are they? True. So uh, yeah. uh, Moog have done it, and Electron have done it. Uh, I don't know about all the. Uh, I'll call it the, the insider gossip of who's actually responsible for it. I think it sounds fantastic. I mean, it, I think it looks fantastic. I think it sounds fantastic. Um, I, I am not sure that I want something that's got the Aphex Twin logo stamped on it. Mm. As much as I love and adore Richard D. James, I, I'm, I'm not going to be that much of a fanboy. So an, an original base station two with that internals. Yeah. Why not? Um, I just wondered if it, I, I hate to anticipate what might be coming, but as we're talking about Novation, I, I think, you know, w there was some breaking news yes. during uh, James' news, which was uh, that it seems that, that Chris Huggett has, has passed away. Yes, we were going to mention sad, that, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, because he's, he's obviously a, a big brain behind it all. So if that's coming up, I should have, perhaps I should have no, shut no, up no, there. No, I'm we'll, sorry. We'll, if we'll I talk about it in a bit. But no, yeah, I think you're right. And uh, that thing you mentioned about having a, a piece of gear with an Aphex Twin logo on, it's like. Can you imagine walking into a, a pub or a venue or something, and you see the gear on stage, and you're not quite sure who you, you know what to expect, and you see a synth with Aphex Twin on it, uh, and you think, <laughs> oh, it's just going to be a bunch of Aphex Twin well, fanboys. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be though, does it? I mean, it's no. what it's what you yourself make it. But 
I, I was a bit. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I love it. I think the artwork is is amazing. I love it. I just sometimes mm, I'm not sure I can I can do with that. I mean, mm. I've I've got a, quite a long relationship with with Novation. I mean, I've I've I can hold, I can hold that up there and go. There you go. I've got my old base station oh, rack. Yep. It, it's 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 very poorly, like a lot of these old things. It, it's got an EEPROM problem, which mm. apparently it, Novation told me they can't fix, which I was a bit annoyed about. Oh. But I've got that, and I've got my Supernova. Mm-hmm. Got nothing newer than that, but I mean, it, it's always there as, as as potential. And I've played on the base station too, and it's a fantastic sounding synth. You know, in itself, it's a it's a bit plasticky and light, but it, it's a great sound. But their, their synths often work. You know, the, yeah. the, this this thing is plasticky and horrible, but <laughs> so um, I think it's a I think it sounds great, and and in, in, in a. What you get a lot a lot of people doing is 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 all these very dramatic sound changes from one key to the next, and and I, and I think I'd be more interested in slightly more subtle changes from one key to a next. So mm. it's not it's not huge huge varieties, but it's, it becomes a more interesting sort of step sequence and modulation source. Yeah. But actually, that you play yourself from your hands rather than pressing a a playback button. So yeah. I, th- I think it's got plenty of of, of mileage as a, as uh, as an idea, and, and I'm sure there'll be more there'll be more companies <clears throat> who implement that on on synths in the future. I yeah. think it's a, it's such a good idea. I think there's enough there there are enough Novation fans and enough Aphex Twin fans for this thing to sell in in, yeah, in numbers so. that, will, that will, will, won't create a loss. Sorry, do you not think that they've like misread the market there because? I don't think that the type of people that uh, synth players are, like like Andy quite rightly said, will want somebody else's name uh, on the synth. It, it's not it's not really the done thing. To be honest, it, it's not quite British. Well, yeah, it's probably oh. more for the fanboys though, isn't it? You know, it's it's for the the fanboy. You're not going to see um, you know professionals on stage. With one of these, unless of course it's Richard D. James, and I'd be highly, highly surprised if um, he didn't ha- at least have one of these on stage with him if he ever does any stage. Because you know what, I might be in a in a in a in a city of population one here. I'm not an Aphex Twin fan. I don't really get it. I just it it's just hard work, isn't it? it doesn't resonate with me. I re- I really have tried. Um, so I don't know that much. I mean, I know about him, but I don't know really. You know. The stuff he done, I couldn't, I couldn't name it's an Apex Twin track. It's a love hate. It's a love hate. Yeah, it it's very marmite, like, isn't it? When I first heard Apex Twin's music, I, I was absolutely, oh my god, this is amazing. I might as well pack up and go home now because this guy is doing what I want to do. He is making those sounds. That's ex- that's absolutely brilliant. I'm never going to be able to do it better. Mm. And then he does some stuff which is just. Just I think, oh, what? Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. Uh, you know, so, some of it is uh, some of it is is sublime in its beauty. I mean, there are some pieces which just could, you could sit and listen to it and it make you cry. Mm. I mean, another stupidly named rhubarb. It, it's just <laughs> brilliant. It, it's it's up it's up there with 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 Brian Eno's Apollo, of of amazing classics of ambient music. It's, it is stunningly beautiful. Yeah. And can, it, it can bring a tear to a glass eye. And then you get then you get window liquor and you're going sorry mate what are you doing yeah. <laughs> just, you <laughs> I know, Chris, Chris is itching to get in here he can do what he wants yeah. you know, he can do what he wants he, he amuse himself he's, he's, in all of his career he's, he's just play on his own for him and bugger everybody else and, oh, and yeah, he's, he's very successful doing it independent yeah. yeah Chris I can see you, you're itching to get in sorry Chris yeah you know it's it's interesting that what, what you say about the uh, the signature model type stuff and people wanting to play them or not and and in the guitar market there's a much bigger market for signature yeah. model guitars in fact probably the most famous signature model guitar was the Eric Clapton Strat and so uh, it is interesting uh, but I do know a lot of people myself included I know uh, Wagyu had chimed in as well I I will buy an artist model guitar if it's not overly obvious that it's an artist model guitar um, and if it's a good guitar if it sounds good so like I think just currently I have uh, an EVH Wolfgang uh, but not so that I can be a EVH clone um, I got it because it's a really great guitar to play um, 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wagyu stuff. Of course, the Les Paul would be the most famous one, but it's oh, almost, yeah. you know, far, far beyond that. But it, not famous guitars that people have played, but signature model guitars that are being sold. You know, uh, there's there's quite a few of them about, and I've had several. But again, I, I really don't like the advertising, even if it's one of my favorite players, because I want to be my own player. Uh, the the other thing was, you know, with the color or the marketing shift is is really an interesting thing to watch in the synth world because if you do it well as a company, people love it. I mean, um, you know, if you make everything in, in black and you come out with a white version, everybody's all over it. If you make everything in white, like the key step, and you come out with a black version, people go nuts about it. And if you don't make a big yeah. deal about it, <laughs> but when you come out and do the same thing and you make a really big deal about it, like the, uh, what was it? The Yamaha montage. Uh -huh. And you're like, Hey, it's our, you know, it's our flagship, but now it's in white. Or yeah. and especially if you charge more for it, yeah. <laughs> then like there's been really big reactions against <clears throat> that, yeah. And that's you know, and rightly so. I mean, it's a it's a bit silly. Like people like yeah, no. Mm -hmm. No, I I hear you. It's it's an odd one. Um, and as as Andrew pointed out, it's it's kind of um, untimely, I guess, because as we we learned today, and the news has um, kind of seeped out over the last 24 hours very gradually mainly because he was a very private person um but yesterday we we lost chris huggett and chris huggett if if you aren't aware of who he is um he's the man behind edp who gave us the wasp and the gnat and the spider and all of those things he's the man behind or one of the people behind um the um oxford synthesizer company that gave us the oscar mm -hmm. He's also, and you know, we could go on for ages, but he's also, and this is the, the reason, this is how I got to know about him, was he was the guy who developed the operating systems for um, Akai's kind of, uh, you know, all-conquering range of, of rack-mounted samplers from the S1000 through to the 3200. I don't think he was involved with the, the, the 5000, the 6000 stuff, although it wouldn't surprise me because it is so good. Um, but he was behind all of those operating systems. And then, of course, he moved to Novation. Uh, well, he started, actually, he started consulting with Novation and then eventually kind of, you know, ended up working there um, pretty much until, you know, the end. And, of course, there's a huge amount of stuff that we have to thank him for. You know, the, the base station, the A station, um, the supernovas, and, mm. and, of course, most recently, Summit and Peak. Uh, which have all had his input on but i've i've known that he wasn't well for for a while and so it's it's really unfortunate that um we have now sadly lost uh a, not just a british synthesizer hero but you know a, a global uh you know synth hero that has come up with so many you know unique and inspiring instruments so it's a real really kind of sad day uh for for the synthesizer community and uh we send all of our best wishes to to Chris's friends and family at this uh, at this difficult time. Has anybody got anything they want to to quickly say about Chris? It's just Any... sad to see that he's passed away. Yeah, because he he's he's had a, a huge influence. You, you mentioned the Akai's. Yeah. Uh, the the Oscar, all all of those things. Anything that he sort of touched had had a, a character and a personality and a, and a charm. I mean, I, I've got the the original the base station. It, the synth has its has its failings and its flaws, but it, it has a a lovely charm. Yes, character. And, yeah, and that exactly. So, and and he and he himself is one of those one of the I think one of the greats. You know, he, he's up there with with the with the big names, the Dave Smiths, the Robert Moe's, oh, yeah. the Tom Oberheims. But you know, he of... may not be as as loudly applauded yeah. as some of them, but he's he's had he's had as as has marked a, an, an impact for, for sure yeah. so um, and, that, and that's the thing as you say you know everybody knows dave smith or tom oberheim um it, chris huggett was is one of those guys that just l really just liked to sit in the background and do his thing and just put it out there and, and let everybody else kind of make the fuss but uh yeah it's a sad day sad day indeed okay well let's move on to something um uh different let's let's talk about this we should actually come up with a little theme tune for this week's news from Beringer land um, <laughs> there's actually um <clears throat> there's actually a few items here so um we'll, we'll crack through each of these 
Um, so let me see. I guess one of the most exciting ones was this announcement uh, on Facebook. We've got some really good news. The firmware for the UBXA, uh, their Oberheim clone, is now completed and they're moving closer to delivering the synth. Um, however, they, they do emphasize that they're many months away from delivery. Um, so they're looking to build 50 pre-production samples and uh, start an extensive test program. And if you are um, an, an owner of an original, um, so there, there are some criteria here. Um, so you've got to own an original OBXA to do comparisons. You've got to have deep technical understanding and knowledge. Um, you uh, own a video channel and you're willing to create sound patches and you can be chosen to be one of uh, 20 beta testers uh, and you'll get a UBXA as your as your reward <coughs> so UBXA hasn't been forgotten about it kind of dropped off the radar and lots you know it's it's one of those things that every time somebody or every time Behringer mentions something there's already always somebody in the response saying well what about the UBXA well this is it so it it seems I mean this picture looks like it's a pretty finalized um, design for the for the actual hardware so now we're going to firmware so that's that was interesting. Um, we'll we'll kind of talk about all of these in one go. The the next thing, um, let's do this one. So this is they're now asking. Now they've kind of got UBXA out of the gate and into development proper. Um, they're asking people for suggestions um, as to what should their next synthesizer be. And they threw up a picture of a Prophet Five, an OBX, an Odyssey. And the Jupiter Eight. Well, two of those we know that they're doing. Um, <laughs> the other two would be interesting to see if they did do, not just from a you know a synth user's perspective, but from a legal perspective, given that the Profit mm. Five is actually a still a thing. Um, yeah. And the the Jupiter Eight, you know, we all know what um, Behringer's relationship with Roland is. So. Uh, of course, there have been well so far to date over six hundred comments on there, and I, I did read through. Uh, a few some of them were you know, that I'm picking out here innovate don't copy um some somebody said why don't you go for an elisa andromeda which i thought was an in interesting suggestion <laughs> others are saying that they should um expand their own unique design so you know a deep mind mark ii or you know something else that kind of follows those uh, i think jamie was one of the the ones asking for a follow-up uh, in that regard but of course you know the world's their oyster they can Copy that. I actually saw a joke today online. Um, why did Uli Beringer cross the road? Because somebody else's intellectual property was on the other side. <laughs> uh, um, which I thought was quite funny. Uh, so the next piece of Beringer news is this, which I, I think is actually probably the most interesting in terms of Eurorack users. This is um, a USB to MIDI to CV and gate module. So I guess it just allows you to um, use all sorts of you know technology within Eurorack, and I think there's already something like that in existence. But that's Behringer's take on it. And then finally, um, RD8 firmware is uh, available now. RD8 firmware 2.0, which of course a lot of people are saying um, will be uh, the next thing to come out of that will be the RD9 because apparently they're sharing you know firmware structures or you know base code. So. Um, that might be interesting. So, who wants to pick one of those? If there's any, has anybody got any opinions on any of that stuff? I'm going to jump in. Go on. Um, then. I'm going to jump in. Um, there's always going to be people that don't like it. There's always going to be people who who find it a bit of a problem that Behringer are chucking out things with other companies' names on them, the and at the prices that they do. And there are going to be all of those people, and I have to put myself in that camp, who are going, yeah, bring it on. I really want this because I can't go out and afford, I can't afford to go out and buy an Oberheim. Mm. I can't afford to go out and buy a, an NARP Odyssey. But I might just be able to save up the pennies and buy myself, you know, the the the, the two thousand six hundred when it's available yeah. or when we can it's available now. Or you know, I think it's I think it's great because it's bringing those things uh, to people that, that can't afford to go out and get them the, these machines which are actually becoming increasingly scarce to get a hold of in decent condition that actually work if you go and pick up an old 
an old you know TR808, the, the chances of it actually being in full working order are pretty slim. Mm. Or even if it's in full working order, the chances of it being in full working order in a year's time are pretty slim. So you've got to factor in all the costs of keeping them going. And I think the fact that you can go out and buy something that's pretty close, got a feel, has the essence, I think it's a, a good thing. It gets a thumbs up from me. Yeah. And and I, you know, I I, I will get more of them as as time and funds allow for, for certain. And certainly the, the two thousand six hundred is definitely on the shopping list. I've got lots of things on my shopping list, but that that's <laughs> been added to it uh, mm-hmm. because it's it's been a a, a machine of 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 lust for for years i've I've wanted a 2600 for as as long as i was into synthesizers Mm. i mean how could i ever afford one yeah i couldn't so 599 quid i'll put my name on the list please indeed um does the ubx a excite you yes yeah i think it does most people it does but i mean lots for lots of reasons i mean my 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 main polysynth the 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 supernova uh it it, it, it sounds great, but it drives me mad. I, I wish it was one knob for function rather than having a thousand and one buttons on it. And then how long this is going to keep working fully is questionable. So I'm going to need another polysynth at some point, mm-hmm. and that might just be just be the one because that mm. that Oberheim sound, if they really capture it, yeah, which they manage to do with with their other things, then. Yeah. I think they've got a, another hit on their hands. Absolutely. Chris? From what I've heard oh. so far, sorry, I was just going to say from what I've heard so far of it, it does it does seem to have an Oberheim kind of sound. Yeah. You know what I'm I think they'll get closer, I'm sure. Um, Chris, now you were the guy that told us about this Eurorack um, connectivity um, hub, I guess you'd call it, USB, 5-pin DIN, CV and gate. Um is this something that will interest you? Because you, I think you're our main Eurorack user guy. Yes, yeah, I've had actually a, a Polyend, which uh, is really uh, <laughs> was overkill for what I needed. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I ended up selling it. It's just nice to have some cheaper options yeah. available on the market. I know there are some other that are cheaper options, but some of the main ones that you see up on reverb quite a bit or the main ones are still going to be twice the price of what the behringer one is Mm -hmm. so that should be good um in regards to the ubxa um you know i see people i mean there's the the main complaint is like why is this thing not out yet but (laughs) on all the synthesizers that are that are out the main complaint is, why didn't you just wait longer and get it right? Exactly. So I, I'd like to at least give them some credit on this project. It's hard for us to wait if we want something that bad, you know. And this is this is a dream machine for a lot of people, but in the long run, I think it is good that they're getting the time. They're they're spending the time, and we've talked about this in the past that this this firmware stuff, them getting things right on the firmware has been stopping them up for a while. So yeah. I think we're beginning to see the hints that that's coming to a close with the RD9 or the RD8 software and then the UBXA. And the UBXA is not something that I, I'll probably buy, even though that's a, a, a great, fantastic sound because I have an OB6. Yep. And this uh, also does Oberheim sounds really good with the SVF filter. But um, I, for someone like me, it means that if they can work out some of their issues with making a polysynth and really put out a UBXA that is uh, is going to be a really great synthesizer, then it gives us some hope for the other ones. Already in the chat room, Jupiter 8, DS80 has been mentioned. Mm-hmm. My, my one that we've always talked about, I, I'm waiting for a four voice, um, yeah. you know, kind of, you know, or sim modules. Yeah. So if, if we can see something that comes out and that people go, wow, this thing is really solid. It's working correctly. Um, there's no issues with the firmware, you know, as much then I, I think it'll be worth the wait. Yeah, absolutely. Ben, what would you like them to produce next? Given that we know what's coming in the pipeline, what, what, uh, what unnamed thing would you go for? But well, looking at the, the the pictures on that thing, like you said, we've already got two of them. There's a whole ton of problems with the Profit Five. There's 
if they're going to clone that, it, it's you can't do it as some sort of uh, preservation thing. No. It, it, it still exists. So the, the the treading dangerous ground there. They have done the the, the Pro 800, haven't they? Yeah. Uh, that that's coming out. So maybe that's kind of as far as they need to delve into sequentials offerings. Yeah. Because you've got a, a mono and you've got a poly. That that's all you should really do. You can't go around cloning every single thing in the product range, can you? So no, no. I, I don't think we'll see a Profit 5. Uh, and for similar reasons, uh, the Jupiter 8 is one that I'd like to see. Mm -hmm. um, but Roland keep reintroducing the Jupiter thing. So that's that's a current, uh, a current, current product line. So yeah. they'd have to be very careful with uh, it, the look, the design of it. it, it may, maybe that's what happened with the uh, the DeepMind 12, you know, because that originally started out life as a, a 106 clone, didn't it? So yeah. uh, it, maybe if you were going to get a Jupiter 8, it would be along the lines of that that DeepMind 12 kind of take on it, where it's, it's just... A similar architecture and sound, but it, it bears no physical resemblance or or naming. Yeah. I think I, I think they might go down that route. Uh, as for the one on the wish list, it, it's got to be the uh, the BS eighteen. Yeah, uh, I, I still want to see that. I think that's that's the one. If they can get that right, then they can do anything. Yeah, uh, and. Obviously, it, it's going to have to have a ton of compromises because part of the CS80 uh, sound is is because of the bulk, isn't it? All those voice cards and yeah. the, the the complex nature of it. It, it. it it's not something that I think you can accurately reproduce. So even though uh, Deckard's Dream did it to a certain extent, but I'd be surprised if you can do it at a really realistic cost. Uh, with a, a totally authentic sound, yeah, uh, I think, I, yeah. yeah, I think you could because remember, you know, the CS80 was using, you know, rather large, you know, through hole boards. When we make a shift to surface mount technology, I mean, there's there's some care needed in layout and and you have the similar issues, but yeah. you can accomplish the same tone of it in a much smaller, lighter package. I remember a lot of it's not the circuit boards, it's it's the housing that the CS80 was in, it's the key structure, um, but you can accomplish much the same thing in a much, much smaller space, just like the one that they have showed. So I don't I don't think it's, it's too far out there. I mean, there's nothing that's, I mean, I got 16 voices right here. They could have probably, you know, Behringer to put eight voices into something that's smaller mm. than that is not a problem, I, I don't think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I keep thinking what what would I like them to do you know what what would be beneficial to me personally because you know I don't care about anybody else um you know what could they make that would make my life um happier and they've already kind of done that with the announcement of the uh the the PPG or the BBG wave um that they, mm -hmm. they're working on that that excited me that was the first I think it was the most excited I've got about um, a, a Behringer clone because that's you know it falls into my little niche and and it would be lovely because uh, you know again yeah. an original PPG wave 2.2 2.3 with wave term or whatever you know they're not cheap they're bulky they're unreliable they're you know they're flaky as hell especially now they're 30 40 years old so um, yeah something that was modern reliable and uh and if they can do that with um, like a wave term uh, plugin or you know computer application or even a like an iPad or an iPhone app that that gave you that that wave term functionality so you can import samples and do all that kind of stuff then that would be great so it'd be interesting to see if that happens I, but I really struggled to think of what else could they do that would excite me that I would like them to do other than that and why not try you know deep mind mark 2 you know with, yeah uh, I, i'm with you on that robbie you know just uh, come actually, up with something new they've they've done so many wonderful clones mm. that actually 
the the two synthesizers which are uniquely theirs because the the the, the deep mind is uniquely bearing it might have started life as a, a juno clone and it might have some passing resemblance but the sound isn't the same it's its own sound and the neutron they've both been extremely successful on their own terms yeah so if 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 Beringer were to produce a new synthesizer of of their own, which isn't harking back to something else, I still think people are going to sit up and take notice, especially if they if they pitch the price well. Yeah, I mean there are all sorts of uh, of, of possible ideas, but I think they've they've got a marketplace for it because they they've definitely got a customer base. Yeah. So doing doing something which is uniquely theirs now, I think will be. Will be a good. They've they've cloned everything else. Right. This is now what we can do. Now that we've got all that experience yeah. of, of manufacturing synthesizers. And revenue. I agree. And revenue. I agree well. with that as well. I think what I would do if I was Uli Beringer, I'd uh, I'd create something like the Schmidt or or, <laughs> or, or uh, the, the Waldorf Wave. Not not a recreation of the Waldorf Wave, but something. A big marquee, like a, yeah. A super synth, <laughs> so people would like kind of disassociate with this little form factor. Toy thing, mm. like uh, we, we mean business. Yeah, yeah, I got a load of this. I, I oh. think that they will, but the I, I would say that the the strategy for as a business. I mean, we're we're talking about what we want as synthesizers, but as a business strategy, you know, you start with the the monos, which everybody's gone nuts over and are buying up. Then we get the four voices that they're in the you know like the poly D. And then now we're going to start getting the polys that are clones of old synthesizers. And so you kind of build up and get everybody buying stuff all along the way. And then later on, you introduce that mega synth that competes with the big guys. Mm, yeah. So I, I, I think, you know, because after you make that really super, you know, amazing one, and it's only 1500 or two grand, you know, compared to its competitors that are many times more, you know, it's hard. It's a little bit harder to go backwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. True. Yeah. Interesting yeah. stuff. But uh, yeah, so plenty of news from from the Behringer camp um, this week. Uh, and we were saying not, uh, just a few weeks ago, hasn't it been quiet? And then all of a sudden, things are starting to ramp up. <laughs> I think it's because everyone's forgotten the old um, uh, cork sniffing incident, and <laughs> and they're moving on. Um, but yeah, some interesting stuff. So um, if you are an OBXA owner. And um, you have uh, plenty of experience in a YouTube channel. It seems you can go and try and be a UBXA tester. I'm still waiting for the PPG wave testing um, that I submitted interest in, um, but I don't think I qualify. Mm. But hey, I thought in for a penny, in for a pound. Um, so one slightly oh, you related. Might be surprised, Robbie. Well, you never know. You never know. Hey, you you're going to be in luck when they uh, do a Furline clone, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, or a, DX, <laughs> or a DX7 or something like that. Yeah, I'll be inundated. Yeah. Um, DX7 not. with loads of knobs on. Well, well, why has nobody did, said that? Exactly. Now, if Behringer came up with a, a an FM synth that was you know capable of importing all the DX7 patches but had a great interface, then yeah, yeah. yeah why not? There you go, Uli, yeah, if you're I might listening. learn to love it then, Robbie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll make you love Don't worry. Um, some, uh, I just want your KX88. That's what I you're want. Not having that. Not having that. Not in a million years. Um, so there was a slightly unrelated piece or related piece of, of Behringer news. So um, Ben Edwards or Ben Edwards, Ben Benj Edwards, um, on his Zach Dagaber channel, did this uh, this video a few few days ago where he was comparing um, his genuine Moog 3C with a Behringer System 55. Um, so he's got both of those in there, and he's just basically just, you know, it's, I'm not going to play the whole thing because it is, it's kind of boring because he's just playing a tone on one and then playing a tone on the other. But um, I I would trust Ben as far as he could throw, a, you know, a paper airplane, you know, a very long way is what I'm trying to say. Probably not the best analogy. Um, if he what he's saying here and he's not actually making a statement here he's not saying one is better than the other but he's just saying look this is what they're trying to kind of replicate here's the real thing not many people have got you know a 3c so he's in a rather unique position i'll let you make your own minds up i've listened to this and i thought that's as close as you would ever probably want it to be 
Um, and again, you know, in isolation, I'm sure you can pick out slight, you know, thing. For me, like the 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 original sounded um, just just had a, a, not so much of a you know it, rounded corners rather than sharp edges, if that makes sense. Trying to <laughs> visualize in words. So make your own minds up. But um, yeah, I was. This is the sort of thing that I like to see uh, from the nicest man in synth, as far as I'm concerned. Guys, um, what do you think? Are you? Uh, did you get a chance to watch this? Um, do you think Behringer have got it pretty close to to what the original does? Uh, Go on. Then. I was going to say, yeah, I think I think that that is uh, a fantastic product where it doesn't really step on the original manufacturer's toes, bizarrely, mm. because the the original product is so expensive that you, you've got no chance of having one unless you're like mega successful already mm. so it's just introducing a whole new client base to that sound uh, and I, I don't think like if, if you're really into that kind of thing i don't think that that's a threat to what, what you do at all because it's a bit like an aston martin with a hyundai badge on it you know it, it it's it's not the same it, you know, an Aston Martin clone with a high Hyundai badge on it. It's like anybody who wants to pay that kind of money for that thing, they want it to be Moog, they want it yes. to be authentic, they want the real thing. So so it doesn't really step on any toes there. I think it sounds close enough uh, for, for me. You know, I, I would definitely uh, be interested in something like that because I think that would satisfy everything I needed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, a tiny fraction of the cost as well um so it, it for me there, there's no negatives it's just yeah. it, it's it's a great thing for me I, I think chris will disagree with that but I'm let's not sure. ask him <laughs> what do you think chris <laughs> shrugs no, I, yeah I, I thought it was good sounding in fact uh some things sound better on the Moog and some things sounded better on the Behringer. Uh, keep in mind that they had two different oscillator types yeah. between the two. So they're not going to sound exactly alike. But um, yeah, I mean, just uh, I, in fact, I'd, I would fault I'd fault Behringer in the fact that uh, on certain things uh, uh, about these clones, they stick too close to the originals and the faults of them. Uh, whereas most people will not have both things to ever be able to compare them. So it, it doesn't really, you know, it's like, yeah, but you want to have this exact thing for people who've used the originals. Do you think people that are using the originals are, are just buying up Behringer stuff in mass? Like, no, probably not. No. And there's a few people like this guy that will, will have them. But, uh, as was said before, just to be able to have, um, these classics go across, uh, a great spectrum of uh, synthesis with uh, diverse uh, economic circumstances. I think I think is wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think, Andrew? Sorry, trying to type at the same time. What, what, <laughs> what, what, what do you think <laughs> about this comparison between the? Well, I mean, uh, Sasquatch made an interesting comment in the chat about no two vintage synths actually ever sounding yeah. identical to each this other. Is true. Well, we know that to be true. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned Chillage people, the the, the the group that I was in way back when. Uh, both Rupert and I had a Pro One, and and although the two synths had a, an identifiable character as Pro One synthesizers. They sounded different. Mine was a, a brighter, fizzier sound than, than, than Rupert's synth. And that's just the, the, the calibrations, the, 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 the wear and tear, the, the different components degrading over time. So, I mean, I bet if you got two Moog 3Cs and stuck them next to each other, they wouldn't sound exactly. the same. They wouldn't even be configured the same. Exactly. They'd have different modules in them as each yeah. user specified what they wanted. So uh, I think what Behringer are managing to do is, is actually get get close enough and, and capture the the essence of the machines yeah that that's good enough for musicians to be happy with what they have purchased because let's be honest they're not actually asking huge sums of money so that makes it even even better for yeah. impoverished fellows like me so indeed I th you know I, I think that sometimes the the comparisons to the original models they 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 make interesting listening 
but you've just got to t- you've got to take it on balance as well. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I feel. Like like you say, you know, no no two uh, originals will sound the same. Um, but you can certainly with watching that, you can see that you know it, they're very very close. Um, and if you know if you were after that sound and that level of control that it offers, then yeah, you, you, you're pretty much sorted there. So that's Benji's uh, video. His channel on YouTube is Zach Dagoba. Um, if you want to go and check that out and and do you know make your own mind up uh, about that comparison. And Benji's also just recently been announced as uh, uh, doing a live improv performance at this year's virtual Sound Mit. Uh, 2020, which is on the 14th and the 15th of November, it's the um, the Italian event in Turin. Um, so he's just mm. been announced as doing a live performance there, which will be um, a, a good a good thing to do. Um, right. So we seem to have just, lost Ben. Just, Sorry. Uh, uh, thanks to to Benj for doing this, because mm. how many people could make that kind of comparison video? Uh, that was fantastic that he did that for us. The wonder, you know, who wonder like, well, how's this sound? Compared to original, we can compare a different a different um, video of something, but we don't know if the recording circumstances are the same. And yet here we have two side by side yeah. in the same video. Mm-hmm. And it appears with the UVXA, that's what mm-hmm. um, Behringer is also going for too, like by reaching out to people who own the original yeah. OBXA. Like, can you compare them for us and do videos that show that they're the same sound? Yeah, and and also the fact that he's made this video and he's done so uh, completely without bias or or preference. Yeah. He's not said, oh yo yo, listen to how crap this is compared to that, or listen to how good yeah. this is compared to that. It's just done. Here's here's this and here's that. Have a listen and and then make your own Cheers. mind. Which is we nice. we lift our cup to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, right, so... Hey, Ben's got a glass. <laughs> See? <laughs> he listens to his old man. Um, quickly, talking of Moog, we won't dwell on this one because th- I'm not even sure I put it on you, your guys' list, but to mark the 100 years of Theremin, um, Moog are actually releasing a centennial version of the Claravox, which is this this lovely, gorgeous um, Theremin instrument. Um, so, yeah, that's... Uh, I uh, can't remember what the price was on that. Yeah, fifteen hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah. And it's not cheap. It's expensive, but it's a lovely looking thing. Isn't it's a it? beautiful so, thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's well designed. It sounds lovely. Yeah, and but, and do you know what? It's one of those things that you could stick it in the corner of a room, and it, yeah, you know, when you have a dinner party <laughs> or the lads round for a piss up or or, or whatever. Yeah, let's have a go on the theremin, shit. you know? Because if you said, if, if you invited your mates into your students, oh, yeah, let's have a go yes. on, on this. You, you're, 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 you're right, whatever. But do it on the theremin, and everyone's like, oh, wow, that's cool. Yes. Straight in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have a show here in the UK, the Graham Norton Show, which is this kind of Friday night chat show on, on BBC. And um, some while back, he. Uh, he had Lady Gaga on and um, a couple of other people. Uh, and I say he had uh, Jodie Whittaker, who's obviously the, the current Doctor Who. And so I guess somebody in the, the research office said, oh, Jodie mm. Whittaker, and we've got a musician, um, Doctor Who theme. Oh, that was theremin. Well, it technically oh, wasn't. Ouch. No. Uh, but anyway, so they got the theremin on there. And Lady Gaga apparently had heard of theremins but never seen one and was just like wigging out on this thing and it was quite funny um but it, it, it's a party piece I as well i haven't seen that I'd yeah have to go and find that it's on somewhere. youtube it's on youtube it's um it's quite amusing um i actually saw um bruce woolley um or ex of camera club and um you know co-writer of video killed the radio star and a bunch of other things i saw him play a theremin live literally you know five feet from my face and it is a wonderful experience because you know how difficult it is because you there are no points of physical reference and to 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 play it well you've got to be pretty much on your game and um it is a it's a it's a lovely experience so i thoroughly recommend going to watch a theremin play but yeah i just thought i'd put that one in there because it was moog related demo um demo video the player on there is fantastic yes yes. the guy has really made it's like just a theremin and piano yeah but uh you know my my still my favorite is uh like watching uh, song remains the same uh led zeppelin live doing no quarter 
And as they're playing, Jimmy Page goes back to his amp and does this <laughs> with a theremin into an echoplex and there's that like trailing haunting sound. Yeah. I mean, just for I mean nothing like nothing nothing that's really credible like that, but as but as an effect, it was so so right for that song. Absolutely. Um, let's do a couple of bits of, of software. Um, so we we would be rather remiss if we didn't cover this announcement that came up this week, given that we are um, fans of uh, the the brand Spitfire Audio have announced a new library, uh, and this is um, Abbey Road One. Now it's not just necessarily a library; it's going to build into a collection of libraries that will you know suit different applications, and that's kind of the, what I took from it. They're launching with. Um, Abbey Road One Orchestral Foundations, which is currently on offer at two nine nine. So that's a, you know, when you compare it to other string libraries recorded at expensive studios, that's a, a very reasonable price. But the 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 kind of um, the the mission behind this one is to make uh, playing a uh, you know like a, a cinema scoring orchestra very easy on. A piano style keyboard so they've, there's a lot of kind of automated features in the background that blend uh, a lot of the samples in um, you know so you, they divide the keyboard up into you know sections and as you go through the low end you get the you know the instruments that, that go for the lower end and as you go for the higher end you get you know so for example you'd have you know double basses uh, down the left then cellos in the middle and then potentially violins up, up the top end so you can kind of you know go through those instruments and you can tweak these things yourself but it's kind of di designed for immediacy and um and that kind of thing and it's going to be this kind of um dare i say use the word modular this kind of you know collection of tools um all recorded of course at the very famous abbey road one studios they did make mention in the trailer that there was something coming up that might have to do something to do with uh studio two which studio is where they're two yes yeah. so obviously you know <laughs> that's the beatles home um but i i guess it's the picture that they throw up on screen was like of a like a little chamber orchestra so maybe they've recorded smaller things in there and that's going to do but it's a great combination spitfire and and, and uh air studios have had a long relationship now we've got Spitfire and Abbey Road, and if anybody's going to do orchestral sample libraries in big name studios, it's these guys. So, uh, first impressions uh, of the trailer and, and the pricing, anyone? Chris, do you? Uh, I know you because you said you know you you went out and bought Core BBC SO Core. Mm -hmm. So I mean that's really a, a, a massive, great collection of stuff, and you probably yeah. won't see yourself having a requirement for something like this. Yeah, I, I, for the amount of uh, strings that I use, I wouldn't need it. Although I, I you know, it would have been a, a tougher decision had this been out when I chose to buy uh, BBC Core. It, I would have definitely considered it because of, as you said, kind of the simplified process of it. I think if you're looking to uh, spend more time on individual instruments, maybe the BBC is a little bit better. But mm -hmm. For, for quick composing and just getting that thing together really quickly and having that wonderful sound, yeah. you know, perhaps the Abbey Road. So I, I'm happy with my decision, uh, but at the same time, I'm sure this Abbey Road sounds really great. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what I've heard so far, it sounds fantastic. And I think, like you say, it's, it's aimed squarely at the, the score composer, um, yeah. you know, the film scoring composer that's, that's going to look for that instant kind of, uh, gratification if you will that they can maybe then you know write their score and then take it into you know the real orchestra but I, I guess you know, I was talking to someone last week who writes music for film and they said that nowadays trying to get an orchestra in the studio at this moment in time is impossible because of social distancing you know even if you could get all I don't know what's it 90 in a symphony orchestra um, if you could get all of those in one room with every, everybody else that you need to, to, to facilitate that, you'd need something like an aircraft hangar. And then, of course, the acoustics are shot to pieces. So it's, you know, it, yeah. it's just impossible. So I, I bet I, I, I'd like to think maybe not, but I bet Christian Henson and, and the rest of the guys at Spitfire are going like, this, this is our time, lads. This is our time. <laughs> you know? So why not? Why not? Yeah. Um, do orchestral libraries uh, mean anything to you, Andrew? Are, are you into that? Do, do they feature in your music production? 
once upon a time, I had a dream of all of that mm-hmm. and scoring a symphony, composing my own symphony or composing my own piano concerto. And every now and again, that dream rears its head and, and goes, you really want to do this, you really want to do this. But m- my computer can't cope with dealing right. with 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 this with those sort of things so i would need a, to have a much more powerful computer mm-hmm. yes it really does yes it really does when somebody comes along and asks me to score a film i'm going to just be in a state of abject panic because i want the wherewithal to do it but yeah i i do hanker after after dreams of doing some some orchestral comp- i mean can, can i can i show you something at this point right Ooh. i have never ever shown anybody this and i'm going to do a big sort of a big reveal Okay, go for it. <laughs> Need the suspense music here. Do, do, do. Help yourself, oh. Right, <laughs> this, this is a uh-huh. handwritten. This is a handwritten score, which I did when I was about 14, 13 or fourteen years old, and it's a piano concerto, and oh. I I composed this and literally, literally, sat at a piano and hand wrote the entire wow. thing Look at that. in orchestral wow. score when I was. It's absolute bobbits from beginning to end. Screen grab, right? <laughs> but honestly, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's sixty-four something like that pages of all. I mean, it, some of it is like it, it's tiny, tiny, tiny. Yeah. And I, and I did that, and, and and I still have these dreams of being a great orchestral composer. I, it'll never come to pass. You never, but never say Somewhere no. like this might one day actually give give me the wings that i need to to do it yeah but so yeah i i, I, I do have those pretentious yeah that's just the scrawlings of a pretentious 13 year old honestly <laughs> no but i'm, I'm sure so, one day oh, your yeah. dream nice. will be realized nice. um indeed <laughs> ben um i know that you you really got into bbc so um you like that uh does this because you you of course have scored for film so this is kind of right up the street yeah, well, I watched um, as part of my extensive research for this segment. <laughs> I, uh, I I watched Guy, Guy is it Guy Mitchell Moore? Uh, yeah, I yeah. watched his demo of this, and it, I think he's quite a good guy the way yes. the way he present, presents things. But it sounded absolutely fantastic, and he was doing very. I don't mean this disrespectful to him because I think he's great. Like, but he was doing physically very little and the software was like you was uh, alluding to Robbie it did a lot in making that seem like a, a realistic playing style yeah just just in vamping certain cards and that sounded like a flute section uh, and it, it, it really sounded quite authentic uh, and just in tinkering noodling away on, on his controller keyboard didn't didn't sound like me messing about with the BBC Symph- uh, Symphony Orchestra one. It, it sounded very orchestral, mm-hmm. you know, it, all all at once. And uh, there was some brilliant, brilliant uh, articulations and yeah. uh, quality of the sampling and everything. Super. So I didn't buy the full blown version of the BBC thing. So I'm quite glad now because yeah. I think I might get this. Yeah, uh, it seems. Like, it, it looks like know, it's really going to be a good thing to build upon as well because you, you buy this orchestral foundations, which will really get you you know up and running, and then it sounds like they're going to be adding in um, you know extra packages that will give you a little bit extra. So maybe they, they'll use you know different mic packages because obviously there there are so many different miking positions, and, and as Christian points out in the trailer, you know it's like the 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 veritable gold mine of um, microphone cupboards at, at Abbey Road, and then you know Studio Two might come along and um, give us you know some some variations there as well. So yeah, it looks like it's going to be uh, an interesting journey uh, building up this kind of collection of stuff. Maybe you know in this in a similar way to, that you can build collections up with um, was it Albi is it Albion that they've got lots of different. Elements I can't remember which ones are, what they are there, but yeah. Um, so I think BBC SO is kind of like this full-on, you know, massive tool. Levels the playing field. Everyone can get in at a price point, and gives access to you know a, a symphony orchestra. This is definitely seems to be more 
uh, towards scoring. So interesting thing there. And it starts at 299, um, going up to 399 after the offer. Available um, a week on Thursday, apparently. Uh, so yeah, there you go, Spitfire Audio, Abbey Road 1. Um, we've got, let's see, two more topics. Uh, Sorry, somebody to say? Uh, while you're looking there, mm. uh, you know, for, for those of us that aren't uh, composing like Ben Simpson or, or writing uh, concertos like Andy Brooks, it can be a, a little yeah, bit uh, <laughs> taunting to... <laughs> To come to or orchestral stuff, uh, you know, if you come from either uh, an electronic uh, background or if you come from a band background like myself, but one of the things that I've uh, I've always really appreciated is and where have got inspiration to um, venture into those kind of uh, strings and horn sounds in even in my own music would uh, have been from the Beatles, you know, and their yeah. work at Abbey Road. But uh, one of the things, the the, the very particular thing is that the Beatles themselves didn't, you know, write much of that. Um, those other instruments that were got used in there, no, that was but George, George Martin yeah. did. And George's, his, his little uh, embellishments to the music were absolutely fantastic. I mean, down to even playing, uh, we played piano on in my life, I yeah. believe composed this little like classical piece fit right into the middle of that song that was so perfect. And so, um, the Beatles are, are definitely something I, I go back as far as composition and go, what is this song? What does this song need? And to think it kind of from their mindset and also from George Martin, like, I don't have to worry about the whole orchestra. I could let me just let's let's just um, focus on maybe four things like a little quartet that would that the Beatles would have used. Yeah. And then, of course, let's all agree that the other great, you know, concerto um composer that i would draw very much my uh personal you know uh, inspiration from would be um nigel tufnell and lines intertwining <laughs> yes uh, and the absolutely beautiful like my love song <laughs> <laughs> it's a love song <laughs> um, yes brilliant uh, gotta got get a spot on tap quote in, there. in many ways though an orchestral score it's just it's just a, a very old analog form of multi-track recording yeah you know i mean beethoven's fifth symphony has 12 tracks mm -hmm. the, the score has five strings three woodwind three oh, it, it's got it's got 12 mm -hmm. uh, and you if you're familiar with that sort of concept of of, of multi-tracking your bass on this and your your, your treble things on there and your drums here and then an orchestral score isn't isn't that big a jump, really. Yeah. To, to be fair, I mean, actually making it sound like an orchestra is supposed to sound when you're doing it within a computer might actually be a bit of a challenge. And that I think, mm. you know, people like Christian Henson, that they're, they're actually amazing at doing that. You listen to some of those arrangements that he does just coming out of a computer, and you go, "Is that really just yeah. done on a computer? That is amazing." So it, it, it you know it can it can be done, but obviously I think having the, the the classical training is obviously a help but it's not necessarily a requirement so mm. i mean when you think yeah, about it when I beethoven composed that he composed that all, all those 12 pieces <laughs> at a piano when he was pretty much deaf but mm -hmm. every part was composed on the piano and, and he has to uh, and and his um all of his peers had to think what does that sound like when played you know with a violin or a contrabass or mm. this woodwind or that brass and that was the skill that he could then compose that, take that to an orchestra and then have them play it. And it sounds good. You know, whereas nowadays we have this luxury where we can sit here and say, well, I need a core on glay. Oh, there you go. There's one. Boom. It's in. I don't have to worry <laughs> yeah. about it. I, I can hear what it sounds like straight away off the bat. So, yeah, it's... Um... Has, has anybody seen the film? I think it's called Eroica. And it was no. just uh, it's just a film about the performance of Beethoven's Third Symphony. Right. Uh, David... David... You list. Oh yes, I've heard of this. Yeah, yeah. with, with uh, the guy who, who played Professor Quirrell in the, in the uh, Harry Potter films. He's playing Beethoven. Right. And and it's just about you know he comes in with his score, gives up, gives out the sheets of paper to the orchestra, and the orchestra play, play, uh, and it's a joyous, delightful, mm. delightful film. And you can see the like the orchestra players go, he wants me to play what? How am I going to play that? I need to stick my hand up my bloody jacksy <laughs> to be able to do that. But it's it's honestly it's wonderful, and and it's also I found it sort of really sort of 
instructive too mm. uh, in, in in that respect. And uh, I, I thoroughly recommend it. Anybody yeah. go away and watch that. You'll love it. It's great. Yeah, some, a day without Beethoven is a day wasted our, anyway. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's our mindset that gets us trapped into what we're supposed to do, and yet the greatest acts uh, or the greatest songwriters of history have, have purposely broke those rules. And and the yes. Beatles are an excellent example of that, where mm-hmm. you know they went into the studio and people are freaking out, like you're not supposed to do that, you're not supposed to do that. And thankfully, by the time that they were getting very experimental they had uh, all the clout and the album sales mm-hmm. to be able to say, you know, no, we are going to do that and to have a producer like George Martin that would allow them to do that. Exactly. Like we're going to run the vocals through a Leslie and we're going to use tape loops and all these things that would, would, would go on to inspire so many other musicians, uh, mm-hmm. not only rock musicians, but of, of many different genres. And so I think to take it back to our own, compositions yeah as you said andrew like to start piece by piece like well first of all there's no there's nothing that says i have to do it this very particular way or have this particular knowledge i could you know do a whole string part and run through a flanger now that might not be <laughs> that might not sound <laughs> good or it might but there's nothing that's stopping us and sometimes we have to get over the mindset of this is what everybody else mm-hmm. does and just do the thing that makes us happy mm-hmm. absolutely okay. Yeah, good right. points. Good points. I can't all. disagree with the word of that. No. Well, so um, I'm conscious of the time, um, and we, we've got a, a chunky topic in our poll, and I want to just get these next two things um, out of the way. Um, so first of all, this one was from Chris. So he brought this to our attention, as so I'm assuming he's had a go with it. Um, this is from Waves Factory, not Waves, Waves Factory, completely different thing. Uh, it's the Echo Cat, which is basically their version of the Watkins Copycat. Um, it's £39, uh, normally 79 so it's a, like a half price offer. Um, and it's based on the, the 58 Watkins copycat delay, uh, which used tape and uh, five different uh, heads. Interesting little thing. Chris, did you um, get a chance to play with this and what are your thoughts? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. So <laughs> what little I, I could. He likes it, I think. Uh, I, I did play with it. So, yeah, I love... I love tape echoes and uh, have enjoyed playing through them when I can, but I have not uh, ever kept one because I hate the maintenance. Mm. I, <laughs> I just don't want to deal with it. Like uh, vacuum tubes are bad enough, so <laughs> and they're pre- they're pretty reliable most of the time. So uh, yeah, so having some 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 really great tape delay and most of the the quote unquote tape delays. Out on the market that are digitally done either in, in you know pedal rack or or uh, software form uh, plug-in form um, you you know they're, they're ish right they, that's about all they can get to is ish yeah um, and there's some really good ones like um, oh crap I just this the uh, what's the space one the Roland space echo the really great plugin that does that uh, there's one by I came with the media the I don't have that, but the other company yes the audio audio thing that's it uh, whatever the, the space one is I use that a lot and, and it sounds very close to, to hardware so the Watkins um, copycat which is this is a, a you know a take on that is a very unique sounding uh, tape delay and, and to me it, it just has a different character to it than say a space echo or an echoplex where usually we hear those two a lot more as um you know when people put them in in pedal form or something they usually tend to go to those but uh this has a very cool lo-fi grungy um the plugin itself has a lot of things you can do with it a lot of tweaks that make it far more versatile than actually using hardware plus you can sync it with your daw right. and doing things like you know, uh, getting tempo stuff that would just be a pain in the ass with hardware. So, yeah. you know, I, I introductory price thirty nine dollars. I picked it up and I'm I'm really happy with it. I think it's going to be one of my favorites, uh, along with the audio thing, um, mm-hmm. Space Echo. Cool, excellent. Well, yeah, that's available now from WavesFactory.com for thirty nine pounds, euros, dollars. I guess it's the same. Currently, uh, normally seventy nine. Um, does does tape echo interest synthesis as much as it does guitarists? 
for that, you guys. That's what I was going to ask you, Chris. I, I was going to say you're mainly using this with guitars because it, it, apart from the Roland Space Echo, I've, I've never really thought about tape echo. Um, I, I, I don't know what benefit I get from it. I, I did like this plugin, but I was interested how you was personally using it. Yeah, I, I, I did a little demo of just having it on some guitar. Uh, but I think it sounds really great on on some classic instruments like uh, you know Fender Rhodes, those or Wolitzer, those type of sounds. Things uh, oftentimes like the more percussive instruments. So where you hear the strike of the guitar string or or the electric piano, and then you hear that the way that the tape echo um, changes the envelope of the note when it repeats, and same thing with analog delay too. Um, yeah, it can add a very, very nice character. And of course, it's all about the grunginess of it and um, the the imperfections and the modulations that happen, the wow and flutter. Now, I mean, a, a, a really well-maintained tape echo doesn't have much of that, but um, most of the time you're not playing a really pristine piece of tape or whatever. So, mm. um, And then also, I think somebody had mentioned um, the Echo Rec, which is uses a metal platter that was used a lot on like Pink Floyd recordings. And that has its own kind of unique warbly tone too. But I, I think it sounds great on synthesizers as well. Um, I, I think, you know, just from my history, I, I, I immediately think about guitar with tape echo, but that's why I kind of wondered, I have used it on, um, you know, some Moog type sounds and I think it sounds great as well. Well, what? Yeah, I mean, uh, Andy and and Robbie, have you guys used any sort of tape echo, either hardware mm -hmm. or software on projects? Used the Watkins Copycat. Nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chilich people. Yeah. I, I, I the, back, back to Chilich people again. Uh, I remember Rupert bought a couple of these things, and one of the ones he bought was the Watkins Copycat, and. Uh, we used it. Well, I'm pretty certain we we had, he had a he also had like a, one of those reed organ things that that you, you plugged it in and it just blew wind through it. I mean, it sounds yeah, like my computer blowing wind through. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then we put it through a put it. Uh, I'm sure we put it through the the, the, the Watkins copycat and it was uh, oh, it was it, it's a, it's a really nice sound. I mean, it, it, yeah, it's delays and it's it's quirky. It was I, mm. I mean. I, I I cannot profess to be an expert. I mean, it, it, it belonged to Rupert. He used it. He he set the settings, and it would speed up and slow down. And he, when he turned this knob, and it would sound like a tape speeding up and slowing down. And, yeah. But it, it it was it was that's a character. Mm. But you're right. I mean, what, what you as an interesting box to have in the studio to to, to create an in, a new sound. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. But, the last thing you want is for the tape to snap when you're in the middle of a, a session. You I've have to get all your happen. splicing tools out and all sorts of things again to put it all right. And now, yeah, I, we, I used they, to play in the. Just a lot of fuss and bother, aren't they? I used but to play they, in the pub they band. They do sound lovely. I used to play in the pub band where the guitarist had one. You bring it out gigging uh, most nights, and it was sit just to the left of me, on you know, the back on the drums, and it would. I'd just be playing the way, and I'd just get look. It was just this hypnotic thing of this thing going round. And the sounds that it was making that he was feeding through it, it was just, it was really pleasant. But I've never really, I mean, yeah, I've got the IK Multimedia um, Roland thing, you know, a copy of that. Uh, and it's interesting, but it's not something I kind of, you know, wheel out <laughs> regularly. Um, but yeah, may, maybe I should. And at this price, you know, Bobby, it's, uh, it's worth a pop. If you have, because uh, I know they, uh, you get a lot of IK stuff. Check out to see if you, if you, I don't know if you have Amplitube or not. I do. But um, the Full Tone collection has the uh, so Full Tone put out a tube take echo. That's mm -hmm. uh, their take on the the early echo plexes, and then they had a solid state version. Uh, the I think the third version of the Echoplex, mm -hmm. um, and so the software has a, the solid state one in there, and it sounds really good as well. Right. And the the actual full tone solid state uh, tape echo is a remarkably good sounding unit, and a lot more reliable than the older ones yeah, too. Yeah, if you have to do hardware. Yeah, I, I do have um, Amplitube and a whole bunch of stuff there. Not that I really use it at all. Um, I did try and sort of trying to get my son into it because he plays a bit more guitar than I do. But, uh, yeah, I'll have to check that one out. 
Um, but yeah, Echo Cat from Waves Factory, um, wavesfactory.com, out now, 39 of your pounds, dollars, or euros. Um, let's do this next one quickly, and then we'll get on to the, the, the topic. So I don't actually know if these are new per se, but Ben mentioned one of these to me. I think it was this version, the PSS uh, F30. Everything your child needs to start playing. You think, oh, it's just Yamaha and another kid, kid-friendly portatone. And then I looked through the range, and there's the F30. <laughs> there's the A50, um, which looks like it's being played by Jim Carrey from Dumb and Dumber. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then there's the the PSS E30, which is being played by a very young child, um, all looking very um, quaint there. And it just seems that Yamaha have landed on a form factor and said, right, let's let's create a bunch of stuff that the only thing that really changes is the um, the board inside and the colour of the plastic. But I listened to, I think it was the F30 first, and I thought, hang on a minute, that actually sounds pretty good. I mean, the actual sounds that were coming out of it were comparable with things I've heard coming out of professional gear. And then, yeah. and then uh, I was going to say, it sounds like the montage. It, it, they're, they're, yeah, I mean, <laughs> and then there's the A50. Now, the A50, I think, is probably going to be the one that interests our audience more than anything else because it actually has a bunch of creative features on there as well as um, USB over MIDI, a um, velocity sensitive keyboard. 42 built-in voices, 138 arpeggio types, motion effects, um, and you can just build up these tracks. It's like 32-note polyphonic, so you're not going to you know, fall short of anything. It's got a little built-in speaker, 37 mini keys. Um, your touch response is even variable. Uh, it's not just a, you know, a standard thing. You can have it light or heavy. Um, and I just thought, wow! And, and the price of this—they're all sub one hundred pounds. The the F thirty is definitely, you know, it, it seems like they've created a range of keyboards. So you start off with, say, the E thirty, which has kind of built-in games and, and makes funny sounds like animal sounds, and then it kind of gets you to match notes and, you know, like a like Simon uh, does in in that kind of uh, way. <laughs> And then you move on to the F30, which is um, you know slightly more advanced. Uh, looks like more more like a traditional, you know, porter tone um, keyboard from from Yamaha. And then you, you you get a bit older and you maybe you know go to college and you take uh, an A50 with you. And you know if you listen to the demo, yeah, sure it's a cheesy song, but the sounds with the phrase recorder and uh, looping around and you can it's. It's as good as any kind of portable music making device that I've seen recently, and certainly, it looks like maybe they've they've come up with this format to kind of compete with all of those apps that you can get on an iPad. And hey, look, you know, have something like that, but with a proper keyboard. And the fact that they've included MIDI on that that final one is is just great. I just wonder what you thought about this as a as a concept. It seems like you know there's a form factor you know based design here, and they're just throwing in um, different boards to to get different performance. I think unless you've actually heard them, uh, you, I don't. I don't think you realise why we're, we're quite so excited about it. Yes, yeah. for that price point, uh, uh, the sound out of them is incredible. For for that, you, you know, you can pay like three hundred quid and have something that doesn't sound as good yeah. as that. That is incredible value for money. Yeah. Uh, and if I was a kid again starting out now this would be the kind of thing that my mum would get me for christmas yeah. and i'd have like a, a wealth of like half uh, decent sounds for for less than 100 quid i think it's great yeah it looks really good and it's it's it's, it's, it's it makes everything accessible at a really affordable price and you know if your kid doesn't take to it you've only spent 60 70 quid which is just you know it's, it's bobbins um yeah chris what do you think yeah, I, so I don't have kids, but uh, we have a, a uh, little niece, and when she comes over, let her play on some of my synthesizers. But the funny thing is that she doesn't want to play the keys. 
she wants me to play the keys and then she wants to turn the knobs and do filter sweeps and stuff. So I'm thinking maybe she might, you know, this might not work as well for her because I'm thinking she's heading down the path of Euro rack. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as for me, I'll, I'll wait for the uh, Apex twin version before I look at this <laughs> I mean, I'm just trying to get a, a picture get of... Get the Richard Clayderman version in this, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I can just get this... Oh, well, it is here. Yamaha, so I'll, I'll wait for the uh, Robbie Pericelli version. <laughs> yeah, they've got to do an FM version, haven't they? Um, so this is the, the control <laughs> surface of the A50, which is more, the, the more professional, shall we say. Um, and it's, you know, it's a very simple thing, but you've got this motion effect, uh, filter, pitch, and modulation... You've got portamento and sustain. You've got you know a bunch of voices, and you can flick through. There's like forty odd, I think they said. Um, and then you've got this arpeggiation, um, and the arpeggiation uh, patterns. There's 128 of them. So there are piano patterns, there are keyboard patterns, there are guitar patterns, strings, harp, brass, even drum All arpeggiations. All controlled by one knob. All- so you, they, they put a super knob on it. Yeah, well you, does it, that would does be good. Does it flash and glow it? blue like, no, it the, like the montage? Unfortunately, and... <laughs> unfortunately not. But you, you can pick any of these arpeggiations and then pick your sound, play it into the phrase uh, recorder, and then just keep looping it and then just playing on top and adding stuff to that phrase looper. And say it's 30-note polyphonic, so you're not going to run out of, um, of notes that soon. And as, as you look across the top here, you know, there's obviously this shortcut system where you use... You know the, the 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 keys to you know change your MIDI data. So you know it's fully capable. Yeah, you know, it's at that price point. I just think that's quite remarkable. And as as Ben points out, um, the when you listen to the sound of them, particularly this one, you think, wow, you know, for for no more than seventy or eighty pounds, it's um it's pretty good stuff. Great Christmas presents for the kids, I would say. Yeah. Anyway, um, so that's just I just threw that in there because yeah, it, it was just quite you know quite remarkable at the price and the quality because I I remember selling you know PSS and PSR keyboards in the eighties and the the nineties and they were just like completely different planets in terms of sound quality and performance and and capability and now these things are just like it's just like everything's merged and is is as good as anything else, right. Let's get our teeth into this one. This will be interesting. So, um, we, we started this last week. We thought every week we'll put a poll question up into the uh, the Facebook page of the group, ProSynth Network, and we'll ask people's opinions, and then we'll discuss them. And that's what we're going to do with this one. And we were a little bit late uh, putting this one up, but the question was this week, um, in your opinion, which synthesizer changed the game in terms of either, not all, but either sound, process, or interface design? So it might have affected, you know, it might have been a great sound and a great interface or a great process and a great sound, or it could have been all three. You know, just, you know, looking at what literally changed the game. Where, where did the, the path of synthesizer development go off on a different course after this particular instrument came into being? Um, I kicked it off with a, the very obvious suggestion for me, which was the Fairlight, because I do believe that the Fairlight really changed so much in, in terms of the way we make music, <clears throat> the way that music is, you know, the, the sounds that we use and all of that stuff. I don't think I need to explain. Um, and then everyone else kind of chipped in. And here are the results. The results from the Swedish jury are as follows. The, the winner by far, uh, with almost... Um, as many votes as uh, the second and third positions um, was the mini Moog, and I don't think anybody would probably argue with that. Secondly, um, and I'm quite chuffed with this one, is the Yamaha DX7. Um, thirdly, uh, with 26 votes, was the Fairlight, and followed by uh, the Sequential Circuits Profit 5, then the M1, the 303, the CS80 only got five votes, um, PPG Wave. Um, specifically here 2.2 but I guess you could say you know all of them five votes uh, Hydrosynth uh, which is like the only modern really modern synthesizer in there um, Jupiter 8 got three Theremin three Moog Modular three uh, Ondes Martino got two votes Steinberg Neon which I know Ben <laughs> threw in there 
as a, as a software option, which you know, is, is valid, absolutely valid. That got a couple of votes. Nord Lead, two votes, and then Novation Peak, D50. And then bringing up the rear guard, we have the Buchler Box, the Troutonium, uh, Analog 4, the CZ101, <laughs> the VP1, the VCS, and then finally at the bottom there, one of my suggestions, because I threw a couple more in there, uh, the Korg Prophecy. And I will explain why I think the Korg Prophecy was a game changer. So in general, would would our panel here agree that the Mini Moog is the uh, the biggest game changer in terms of synthesizers ever? Would you agree with that? Cine dubito, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Every every single synth that comes thereafter has has, has used that basic model. Mm -hmm. You know, it, yeah. it's 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 defined the if you like the voice architecture of virtually every synth that comes thereafter with perhaps one or two notable exceptions you could argue the dx7 yeah so definitely definitely for me that the, the mini moog is is the archetype upon which everything else is based yeah chris yeah <clears throat> no doubt about it uh and in fact uh, I think Andy said it really well. I wouldn't even add anything to it. The Mini Moog is the reason that I got interested in t in synthesizers. So for for me personally, and also uh, on a more uh, objective level, I think it is the thing that really inspired everything in a way that even the modular couldn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Ben, what about you? Agree? Uh, again, I agree. Uh, I think everything else uh, as took that technology and, and improved, developed it in some fashion. Uh, and like Andrew said, probably the, 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 the only exceptions to that would be the, the digital big boys, you know, like the, the fur, like the DX7, that they, they kind of, but there's still little elements of it in there. Yeah, absolutely, but, yeah. Yeah, it, it's... It was a, a really defining moment in synthesis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So let's go down to position two, um, and that had thirty-five votes. Was the the DX7? Um, so I'm I'm going to go first on this one. Andrew's got his face in his hands. So not bad for a doorbell, eh? Eh? <laughs> no, but I tell you what, I've so I've often pondered this question myself and it's why I threw it in there because I was clutching at straws for the question late on this week so I thought oh yeah I'll do that one that I always think of I always think about game changing since you know where where did you know where where was that um, fork in the road that you know that synthesizer development went down what made it go down that and so you always start like you know, we've just said you know with the mini moog that was the one that kind of set the foundation in terms of the not just the the way that we synthesize sound in that manner, you know, subtractive analog synthesis in that workflow, but also, you know, the the, the physicality of the instrument, you know, the, the the pitch bend and and you know that it was just every kind of synthesizer can kind of trace its DNA back to that. Then I think the next big thing, because there, there've been, yeah, you know, and don't get me wrong, there's some fantastic synths that happened between the Minimo and the DX7, but the DX7 was the one that really said, we're off this way now, and you know, hold on to your hats, because everything else that came before it was just an iteration and an expansion of the Mini Moog, and then DX7 comes on and says, we're gonna go over here, and we're gonna do things completely differently, and you know, uh, it borne out in the terms of, you know, in terms of the number of units sold, and the amount of records that it was heard on, you know, you cannot argue with that. Then I think, coming after that you know you've got the fairlight as well of course which takes them off in you know in the sampling direction then you get the workstation so i think the m1 which i think is mentioned you know i think the m1 was you know it was a great thing and then you get into physical modeling which i think there was a good argument in there about the fact that it didn't stick long enough for it to be massively influential that's you know that's to be debated but yeah the the dx7 as much as it comes in for a huge amount of stick and i think it, it's 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 kind of Coldplay syndrome, you know, U2 syndrome. Once something gets really massive and ubiquitous and is everywhere, then the only, you know, the only way is down. And so, you know, people, you know, it becomes fashionable, I guess, to, to, to slate it. And uh, eventually people appreciate it for how good it was, which I think is this, that time is now. Um, but it just, it literally just changed the game because it gave you polyphony. 
uh, you know, massive polyphony. Uh, it gave you, you know, sound you'd never heard before. Um, and of course it gave you the, the, the world of presets, um, which had never really existed up until that point. So that's me with the, I, I completely agree that the DX7 is probably the next mate or I would say the Fairlight in terms of chronolo chronological order, it was Minimoog, Fairlight, DX7. But yeah, I, that's how I go, agree with that. And what you guys I, think. Can I, I'm going to jump in again here, Robbie, actually, go if, if I may. Um, I, I'd like to disagree with you. Uh, for, for, this, for the simple reason, I don't, I don't disagree with any of the points that you've made about the DX7 as a synthesizer but... and, the influ and, and the influence that it had upon the manufacture of, of other synthesizers. Mm. But I'd actually argue that the Fairlight was a much, much bigger game changer oh, yes. in terms of the way that music was produced Absolutely. and the sorts of music. And 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 for that for that reason I, I only clicked two. I, I clicked Minimoog and Fairlight because mm -hmm. the Minimoog set the, the model for synthesis synthesis and the Fairlight sets the 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 model or, or or starts the ball rolling for yes. the entire sample and therefore sample based scenario that comes thereafter yeah and and I, and I think that's that's hugely more influential i mean i i think everything that you said about the dx7 is is absolutely right i mean it, it is it, it is in itself a, a beautiful instrument to play i mean we know that um but did it change music production Production, did it, did no. It, mm, and and that, that that's the reason why yeah. the, the Fairlight got yeah. my number two vote. Uh, absolutely, and I, I you know I, I I mentioned this in my my seminar about the Fairlight that it is you know it's that point where all of us that make music or had been making music in the last you know twenty thirty odd years can trace everything that we use back to the Fairlight because you know it's on screen digital sequencing, so, yeah. it's sampling. It's you know it's synthesis. It's you know one person making music um, with lots of instruments, you know diverse instruments. You know it really is it's that kind of ground zero point for the way that we've been making music for the last thirty forty years. And yeah, you I absolutely you agree. Because you, not only can you hear a Fairlight, uh, you know it's distinctive. You know <laughs> the fact that it's sampling, but you can also hear the Fairlight in the programming and the production. You know you can hear a fair. I can hear a Fairlight song. Even if it's not using traditional Fairlight sounds, because you can hear Page R. Page R has a sound, mm -hmm. you know, and that's 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 a really cool thing about it as the well. The drums and opportunities. Yeah, any of that stuff. You can hear that tight as your nuns chuff, you know, timing, <laughs> um, but with that really kind of you know, it's there's there's, there's you know, it's it's almost as unique as the swing on an MPC or the the slightly off snare on a lindrum you know it's that it's that it's a there's a very unique sound to it you could argue that um maybe the fur like had a similar impact on music production uh, as to uh, an item in the list that scored much less which was steinberg's neon <laughs> go on then what's your case for steinberg's neon go for it well on. all right yeah I think I, I think you know, what you're saying about about the fur, the Fairlight is totally valid and, and correct, but I'd also argue that the the Steinberg Neon, while being a, a bit naff, especially by today's standards, it's kind of set the ball rolling to actually move away from physical objects. So a lot of a lot of music has been produced totally in the box. That wouldn't be possible without the the advent of virtual instruments. I think it's mm. it, it's a massive shift. It, it's not just oh yeah, it's a little poxy synth from Steinberg. It's a massive shift of we don't even need physical things to do this anymore. Mm. We can do this just in our computers, and everybody can do it. Doesn't matter how much money you've got, you know. Yeah, it, yeah. No, it, that's a valid point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Chris. You've been sat there quietly cogitating, contemplating. <laughs> Positions two and three, DX7, yeah. Fairlight, I guess. Do you have any arguments yeah. for and against? Uh, let, let me go back for just a second. I'll make mm. two points. So going back, because I think people are going to wonder, like, why not Buchla and West Coast Synthesis? 
I, I, I think as a thing, it's very interesting, and it, it, it really has a, an important part in synth history, but why I don't think it should score as high as DX7 or Mini Moog or Fairlight or whatever is that it just didn't have the kind of influence. It didn't affect things the way that these other synth synthesizers set, did. Mm -hmm. And so moving forward to something like the Fairlight, I think the Fairlight had... I mean, obviously used on some really famous tracks, but for a pretty narrow uh, portion of time, I think its effect was primarily on what came after it. And so something like the Korg M1, if I, I would say would, would have to be one of the big contenders because it was used on so much music. It yeah. became um, that kind of, that style of, of Rompler became ubiquitous mm -hmm. and had a much greater direct effect on sound and also had a big effect on what how synthesizers were. But I think it, it in itself owed a lot to, one, the sampling of the Fairlight and the interface of the DX7 mm -hmm. and all that. Now, one that we might actually toss in there that was, I would have put it in the poll, but I it, i don't know, I just didn't think of it, um, that we have skipped over that was it a very important thing that you would say was probably, uh, well, I don't know, I, I, I'd be putting words in people's mouths, but to me it seemed like the earlier, you know, the earlier version of the Fairlight, really, uh, in a way, in a way, <laughs> it, and that would be the Mellotron. Mm. Mm -hmm. and yes. that you're using analog tape samples yep. and it was really doing what the Fairlight did later in digital but all of a sudden it revolutionized things that bands could um, you know all the strings that John Paul Jones used on tour uh, with Led Zeppelin being able to play it on a Fairlight or King Crimson or, mm -hmm. or any of these bands that now had access to orchestras of sound within a, a keyboard unit yeah and yeah, that absolutely. would have probably been one that would have been a very, very uh, influential. Yeah, and, and also, like, uh, uh, sorry, uh, let, let me just think this in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the way that we think about how we use keyboard instruments, I think the Mellotron was very influential. Instead of thinking about alternative sounds and, and uh, crazy experimentations with modulars, and there were some guys that were using it for, you know, more normal sounds, but the way that it brought um, synthesis in a way, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not talking about subtractive or yeah, yeah. additive, but in synthesizing other instruments in keyboard form, mm -hmm. that would be one of the most important instruments yeah. ever created. Because what what, Sorry, what, it, what it was doing, what the Mellotron was doing um, was taking a, a real sound, recording it and playing it back in a way that gave you the essence of that sound, but it wasn't that sound you knew you knew that yeah. those flutes on strawberry field sounded like flutes but they didn't quite you know it wasn't yeah. quite a flute the strings um on knights in white satin or, or any of those uh, things <laughs> that used they were string-esque but they weren't it wasn't a properly recorded string section and that's what the fairlight was doing certainly you know, the 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 one and the two was that when it sampled stuff it sounded as close to a piano as you were ever going to get, but not quite a piano. And it had that quality. Yeah. So it changed, you know, that kind of thing. And it gave uh, a new kind of color and a new palette to, to you know, to, to those sort of things. And yeah, I, I agree exactly. with your point about the M1 yeah. as well with, with keyboard workstations. So the thing with the Fairlight is this is a machine that costs anything between 25 and $100,000, uh, depending on the configuration very few were made in comparison you know just a few hundred across all series not many people uh outside of you know the music industry and and then it was an elite part of the music industry could afford one so when the m1 comes along and completely democratizes workstations and you know multi-track recording in a single box mm -hmm. with sounds that are really really good sampled sounds uh and a sequencer 16 track sequencer um that's when yeah i mean that's when the i think that whole concept of hey i'm a one person in a bedroom with a limited budget if i buy an m1 i can knock out a track yeah. that will sound as good as pretty much anything that's out there if that's I... what that's what the m1 actually really succeeded at yeah uh, not not so much in in and of, of itself i mean 
Okay, so some of those sounds were fantastic, but it was a synthesizer. It was pretty dreadful. Oh yeah. But yeah. what came after it in the in the the entire workstation concept, which is still with us today, it was it was hugely it was hugely influ yeah. influential on what came after. Other manufacturers realised that they had to up their game, and and change and change what they were doing. Yeah, um, cause even, and and after that, there were there were, there were huge numbers of of these workstations. Yeah, because even today, in our wonderful world of um, doors, <coughs> where we can have you know a, a choice of a, a myriad different um, sequencing packages, whether it's on a Mac or a PC or even on a tablet workstations are still being made and still being sold in mm. numbers that justify them being made um and that, and they're not cheap and people are still buying them so there's still you know there's yeah. still a market like you say that's a market that's been there now for um 30 odd years which is yeah it's got to be massive it's, it's extraordinary i mean all those all those current range of, of yamahas the montages the modi X's. i mean you could even you could even argue that something like the, the ak mpc is is in is in Direct, direct lineage. It's got synthesizers. It's got samplers. It's got huge sequencing capabilities mm. and effects built in. It's everything in a box. And that that, that was another notable omission was was the MPC. And I'm talking, you know, that first mm -hmm. generation of MPCs that literally changed it's, it's a game the as well. Synth that's the problem, isn't it? I mean, yeah. You could argue that if you talk about synthesizers, things like the, you know the. The, the archive range of samplers shouldn't be in there because they're not synths, they're samplers. Mm. Uh, I mean, I know you, 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 you're splitting hairs, yeah. really. But well, somebody mentioned in the it, comments it no um, about the Fairlight and that actually maybe the emulator was, was more of a game changer because it brought sampling to a much wider audience in terms of affordability. And then, you know, shortly after, Akai were doing the same and Sonic were doing the same. Um, oh, yeah, so the Sonic, Sonic Mirage. Yeah. But then Absolutely. they were all the bringing, you know, they're bringing it down closer to to more mm -hmm. more people's, you know, uh, wallets um, than you know a fifty thousand dollar Fairlight or Synclavier or whatever it might be that you're into. And again, the Synclavier never got a mention on there, which again surprised me. Uh, even it's though I, would, beast, isn't it? it's a horrible thing. Um, it's yeah, it makes some amazing sounds, but it really is truly a horrible thing. <laughs> um, I know I'll probably get slated for that. I'd, I'd love one, but it's a horrible, horrible thing. Um, horrible. It's how, horrible. How, in what way? Um, beautiful. I was. I was. It looks amazing, but it's it's um, very difficult to to use, and certainly oh, yeah. nowadays it's yeah. very difficult to maintain. I mean, I hear horror. I mean, I I I know people have got Synclavias and Fairlights, and the Synclavia ranks right up there as one of the. Um, so we've just upset Andrew. Uh, it, it ranks it ranks up there as one of the the, the most frustrating machines to to maintain, um, but it is ultimately you know it's it's rewarding because of you know the stuff that it can do. But it's so big and there's so many different versions and you know yeah. you got stuff with the FM or without the FM with the hard disk recording without the hard disk recording with the sampling without the sampling. It was um, definitely more of a university machine I think that one. But anyway, um, yeah. Yeah. what did surprise me were some of the other um entries in there not so much that they were mentioned but that they literally only got you know some of them only got one or two votes for example um you know the cs80 and the jupiter 8 you know between them mustered eight votes you know five for the cs80 three for the jupiter 8 um moog modulars i mean again you well, could I mean, argue that the moog modular was was yeah. hugely influential but um but the the, as far as the the defining thing that yeah, I think you had put on there is like you know the game changing yeah. whatever whatever language you used, yeah I mean would we say that the CS80 and Jupiter 8 are some of the greatest synthesizers ever made? Absolutely. Did they did they change the course exactly. of synthesis? Yeah. Not really. No. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, in fact, they they kind of were the uh, uh, the the end of that. <laughs> they were. They, they were the pinnacle. Yeah, they, they were the, yeah. the, the, the summit, um, you know, obviously, yeah. Not, yeah, they were the summit of that kind of thing that that then eventually, you know, because as soon as the DX7 came out, people threw all that stuff away. I mean, not, you know, that's that's quite a casual glib remark, but... I, I bet somebody did. I oh, yeah, lots of people did. No, I, re I remember people, you, know, you could... <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they were, you know, just... Let's find that bastard. Yeah, <laughs> there's so many stories of, of people just abandoning this stuff because... 
you know the new kid was in town it was different and the same you know and the same happened to the dx7 when the d50 came out everyone's like wow the d50 now that really sounds amazing and again you know that only picked up two votes but that was a completely new form of synthesis using pcm samples as the attack portion then using synthesis to pad that out that then went on to breed this like decade-long probably more more than a decade long uh, dominance of yeah of sample and synthesis (laughs) of of almost and general midi you know you know all of that Mm -hmm. kind of stuff so but could could i give a honorable mention sure to uh the jd800 which i didn't nominate myself because i didn't want to but the jd800 (laughs) right it's a cracking little synth i've got one here no it's not little it's (laughs) far from little but don't you think that that took this uh, menu-driven digital synthesis idea where you had, like, one slider and, and said, yeah, you can have this technology, but you can have it in a knob per function yes, yeah. layout. Uh, and that has had a huge influence, really, on what's come since. Whether you like the JD800 or not, everything has gone the root of the JD800, where they've realised that digital technology is more stable, it's more reliable, you can do more with it, but everybody wanted the hands-on control. Yeah. It's a, a really good remark, that, yeah. that Ben. Well, that, that was a thing, wasn't it? You know, In in the mid-90s, um, there was this realisation. I mean, y- users had realised it for some while because you know the kids were going out and picking out of the trash can and the dumpsters, they were picking those old analog synths that had been thrown or were being sold at Goodwill stores like the 303s and the 808s. They were picking those up for next to nothing. And they were saying, hey, we've been brought up with a range of synthesizers where we can't go like this and we have to like menu dive and, and live performance of filter sweeping and all that kind of stuff just isn't a thing. And that we're going to make that our sound. Then in the mid '90s, the manufacturers eventually kind of cotton on to this and say, "Right, we need to produce um, our new synthesizers using our modern synthesis technology, such as sample and synthesis, uh, but we need to put controls on them uh, to you know to to give them that control back." And there were some good efforts, and there were some not so good efforts. I remember the the CS1X, which was this you know that and the AM1X, um, you know, were these kind of two new synths. In very similar styles, one was a genuine virtual virtual analog, which sounded and operated really nicely. The other one was based on S and S, you know, the the uh, AWM uh, mm. stuff that Yamaha had. <laughs> and when you swept through the filter, it stepped like a mother. I mean, it was like, you know, it was horrible. But you had a controller, and the kids loved it. And I thought it was great. You know, some patches were better than others, but um, yeah, it was all about getting. It's not a Smith song. Yes, yeah, some patches are better than others. Um, <laughs> But you're right, you know, the, the, the JD-800 had that thing. Of course, you know, it it's it, it, ch- it did change the game for um, synthesizer repairers uh, in later years. <laughs> with the, with the, um, with the... As, as did the Juno 106 and its uh, voice cards. Indeed, yeah, so it was influential. Just a little bit later. Yeah, so I'm gonna they throw... should have both been nominated for their yeah. contributions to the synth repair community. So I'm going <laughs> to just bring up this point about um, modelling synthesizers because that, that's something, again, that's, that's kind of close to my heart. Mm-hmm. Um, so I threw in there a couple, and I thought, well, I'm, if I throw in the prophecy which I think was a bit of a game changer. Um, I'm going to have to throw in a Yamaha one as well because they were you know, the, the kind of the real uh, big adopters of, of, of modelling. But as I was then um, very ceremoniously you know, um, whacked down by, uh, by Manny Fernandez when he said, look, you, know, you can throw physical modelling in there, but it didn't last. The audience was too small. It never really took off. And so you can't really say that it was a game changing synth. And of course, he's absolutely right. Um, but, you know, the prophecy, I, I remember when the prophecy came out, and it was all over stuff for about a year and a half, two years, you know, Prodigy on Fat of the Land and a bunch of other things as well. There was this, and it, it was kind of around the time, because I know the Nord, was the Nord Lead was the f- kind of first proper virtual analog hardware synth, or one of them. Um, yeah, but would you consider like the D50? Because that 
the virtual analog. Well, yeah, that's a that's a good. Ar- I mean, that's an argument that you could probably have for a very long while. Whether that was a proper virtual it, analog. at least at least we would call it like virtual subtractive. Yes, synthesis, there, there was some kind. Co- yeah, synthesis. there was. It wasn't called it at the time, but it certainly had. Yeah, yeah. It had that to it. But when you think about the virtual um, analog and the virtual, you know, that, that whole kind of era of, you know, in the early mid 90s when you had the Nord Lead, then you had the JP8000, you had the Yamaha AM1X, and they were all focusing on analog. Supernova. And that's, Supernova as well, yeah. Um, but then you had, <laughs> but then you had Korg who said, okay, well, look, we can do that, but we can also do acoustic modeling. And then, you know, obviously it was followed with, with the Z1, which gave you polyphony, and the VL, it, they never really stuck. So I, I guess, yeah, I'm going to have to kind of withdraw my entry there to say that they really didn't change the the game hugely. But I still think they're worthy of a mention because physical modelling still has yet to, uh, you know, get yeah. an audience. I don't, I, I don't even know if it will. I, I don't think we're done with physical modelling. I, hope not. I think. I think that that will come back um, bigger and better than ever before. Um, I don't think Spitfire is going to like it, though. No. Well, <laughs> I mean, the, the thing is with, with oh. model, physical modelling, acoustic modelling, is that um, up until recently, you know, if you wanted to physically model an orchestra, you would need huge amounts of processing power. You know, I mean, if you look at the, you know, if you look at the VP1, which was 25 years ago, um, you know, that had an inordinate amount of DSP chips in there, and it was thirty thousand dollars then. Um, so you know, you try and get it down now. And so now we're seeing um, there's a there's a software company that's doing, you know, model strings, and you know, it sound, you know, the polyphony's there, and you know, the sounds there, it's. Um, it's definitely there, but I think sampling, you know, if you look at the intricacy of sampling um, and, you know, the stuff that like, people like Spitfire are doing, I, I think that's going to take some beating. And I don't think modeling is going to yeah, be quite there. I think the, you know, the, the sampling, I mean, it has to go somewhere else because w- w- with modeling and uh, computer processors increasing, that will eventually take over, and it usually does better. I, I think sampling has been, a, 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 you know, a CPU-friendly way to do it, mm. and certainly have have had some really good examples, and um, and, and great ways to do it. But um, when modeling, you know, takes over more, I think the the future of sampling will be in what you do with samples, and I think that you know, with granular synthesis, yeah, that's where it survives into the future. What do you do when you take that sound and then you mangle it all up, you know, in your computer or your synthesizer and uh, to to do something else? That's the future uh, of of sampling, I believe, because eventually we'll be able to do all the modeling with the with the computers. And that's what that's kind of been my point with Zincor. It's like it's just a temporary stopgap yeah. for a moment because eventually the component model ACB will be the thing that is everywhere eventually because of processing power we'll be able to handle it and who would want the thing that's not that doesn't sound as good mm. in the future if you can have the thing that does sound the good you know the best a component model virtual analog and your computer or your synthesizer will be able to handle it yeah it is it's an interesting i mean you know when i think about acoustic modeling i i think about good acoustic modeling is it seems to be you know solo uh, solo instruments you know saxophones clarinets trumpets solo strings guitars drums that kind of thing when you're looking at big ensemble type sounds like an orchestra um i just think that there's so much nuance there that even right now we don't have you know that processing power to deliver that and samples do you know samples it's it's obviously it's a very laborious task but once you've got that and you've programmed the script at the front end, then it it, it then becomes hugely flexible. So it's, I think you know it's it's a long way. Um, can I can I just have a, yeah. a, bit, a bit of a go about this because uh, in spite of what we we're talking about about using these great sample libraries to to score an orchestra, you are not intending that to become 
the final product. I'm sure that the end product, you would want a real orchestra to play it. I mean, no matter how good these physical models are, no matter how good these sample libraries are, I am never going to sound as good a saxophonist on my keyboard yeah, here yeah. as a saxophonist who is an expert in that instrument with a saxophone in their hand. It, yeah. it just it doesn't equate to me. And, and that's always been one of my real problems with physical modeling. I mean, what, what fascinates me more is where you can take it in terms of the realms of synthesis. Now, you, you mentioned mm -hmm. the Yamaha uh, physical modeling synth. Uh, years and years and years ago, when, when I was actually recording a, a, a single, it was a cover version of the Doctor Who thing, but the, the, the guy who, who I was recording this with, who was at, whose studio was, I was using, had a, I think it was the V VL1M, yeah, is that what it was? The, yeah. the, the module. Yeah. And we used a string model. It was just a violin string model. And somehow, whatever we did to it, and it sounded like somebody hitting a, a massive, great big metal pipe with another <laughs> great big metal pipe. It was this. Yeah. It was this monstrous industrial resonant metallic clang. It mm. was amazing. I don't know how we got. Don't ask me what we did. But that was a, a, you know the violin model, and this is what it ended up sounding like yeah. as you pushed the parameters into different areas. And that, I found, absolutely fascinating. And, and that, yeah, to me, is also where, you, where your prophecy comes in, because that, that's got the, a similar sort of... Yes. And that's, that's, the, that's, that's, know, that's the, what excited me about it first, was the ability to take um, and combine the models together. So you could effectively uh -huh. have a, uh, like a reed model resonating in a guitar resonating yeah. model. Exactly. Yeah. And, and come up with just stuff you'd never heard. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I, I think we're, we're kind of on the beginning of modeling becoming, uh, physical modeling becoming a big thing again. And we're starting to see it in the market now. In fact, some of the, the you know most prominent examples would be uh, things that... Uh, IK Multimedia has done. They've done the uh, Moto drums, yep. and uh, yep. was the bass Moto bass also modeled? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we're 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 beginning to see it, but th that's not the most interesting part because we can't do it a lot with it. At least with like a a bass guitar, you don't have it's not an orchestra. You don't need that much power to do it. But the fun thing will is when we do get back to that VL1 type of attitude where we're coming back at it. What I don't know, twenty years later, twenty something years later, yeah. is that? Actually, right and then what can we do like change like uh logic has that physical modeling uh synth that i, I i've just totally mm, forgotten about yeah. that it's even in there until now where you can start mixing around like do you want it to sound more like wood or metal mm -hmm. um and then where else can you go with it just like granny what granular did for sampling if we could have something that does that for modeling like let's start making weird sounds oh you know, like you did with the fair light where you take something and you pitched it yep. one way or the other and it, and it sounded totally new, nothing in nature okay. like it. Physical modeling would be one of those ways that we can get into those sounds. And and this yeah. is this yeah. is yeah. synthesis is synthesis is, I think that's a word. This is <laughs> synthesis is long in, running um, issue in that if you look at the synthesizers of the 1970s, there were switches on there you know, where, where you had certain presets or you had patch sheets. And those patch mm. sheets or those presets were all oboe, piano, reed. violin, reed, <laughs> brass. And they sounded nothing like it. But they were trying to do that. Sampling comes along, yeah, sampling comes along and says, well, we can record those sounds and do that. And then digital synthesis comes in, DX7 and all of that stuff, and they, it, they fall into the same trap of trying to recreate um, acoustic instruments in a synthesizer. It seems like that's the goal. We must try and replicate what is almost impossible, you know, with a synthesizer. And yes, they, you know, some of them did things very well and some of them didn't do them, you know, do those things well at all. Physical modeling comes along and what's the first thing? Oh, let's try and recreate violins, brass, wind, reed, blah, all of that kind of stuff. And they, they kind of get lost in that. 
And you know, Peter Gabriel said um, after he heard 19 by Paul Hardcastle, he said, mm. with all due respect, that song has set the art of sampling back at least 10 years. Because what he <laughs> was doing with sampling was, as Chris has just pointed out, you know, recording metal pipes, smashing TVs or blowing, you know, wind up something and, and sampling that and then <laughs> pitching it around and, and creating new sounds. And that's what acoustic modelling and, and physical modelling should, should be doing is using real world examples and models, but to create new sounds that we've never heard before. So let's stop trying to replicate a violin. Let's try to stop trying to use acoustic modeling to replicate an orchestra. Let's use acoustic modeling. Um, you know, let, whatever happened to formant synthesis? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm really getting into this now because I've had it for a little while. And this whole, uh, I've been studying how to create formants. And, you know, we, I think, you know, the, the human voice, when we speak, we only require three or four formant kind of shapes to make you know all the sounds that we make when we speak. Yet this synthesizer has forty odd p potential formant shapes that you can create. Why aren't we? You know, why was that never explored? You know, it's just crazy. There's, it's because we're well, always trying to recreate maybe, maybe, what's already there. Yeah, but also too, I mean, it, maybe it suffers from the same thing that the the additive synthesis or uh, you know like the. Uh, or uh, the face modulation that the DX7 did, mm -hmm. that the interface and the ideas behind it are maybe not quite as easily intuited by by users as quickly as something like subtractive synthesis or sampling, which which both are very easy to get your head around. Yeah. So maybe it would come down to if we could do format synthesis in a way or physical modeling ex exploratory stuff in a way that was a little bit easier, a better interface for the user to interact with it and be able to come up with sounds and, and understand how it works. It might be a, uh, it might become more popular that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I just think sometimes we, you know, we dabble, or, you know, we, as in, you know, the, the synthesizer industry dabbles with new technologies and you know sometimes they sit, stick and sometimes they don't and i think the crucial factor is how easy is it to comprehend and how easy is it to get something productive from it as quickly as possible and analog subtractive synthesis i mean i i keep saying this uh, i still don't understand why it is the benchmark uh, of of everything else everything gets compared to analog subtractive synthesis and the reason i guess is because it is straightforward. It is simple. You don't need a degree to understand how it works. I can show a kid how to use an analog subtractive synthesizer. I can, you know, I put, yeah. uh, you can put a, a 101 in front of anyone or a mini yep. Moog in front of anyone and say, this does this, this does that. The outcome is going to be X. Off you go. And, and you can start <laughs> making sounds and then exploring and understanding it. Whereas you it is stick, really easy. Yeah. But you, yeah. you give that same child a DX7 or you know a physical modeler and, and say, so here's the manual, boom, well, boom. And then here's, you know, and you're going to need... But I would say that it is possible because it does have consistently, um, you know, when you, when you use that kind of, uh, you know, DX style synthesis, it does have produce consistent results by doing these things, by using this yeah. algorithm. It just takes longer to kind of get your head around it. I mean, just, just as an example, um, I watched a Ted talk where this guy, and this is, this is maybe 10 years ago or something. He would put uh, PCs in a box where nobody could mess with it or steal it. He would put it in countries who had never seen any sort of PC. He'd just stick it in a village out in the middle of nowhere um, and then children who did not understand English would come and play on it. And it had a mouse and a keyboard mm -hmm. and, you know, and he, and he would just record what they did. They were able to figure it out. You yeah. know, and we're talking whatever windows XP or something. They didn't even speak English and they were able to figure out what it does. So wow. I, I, I think it can, I mean, it does produce, uh, and that's the one thing I don't like about the conversation about, um, the FM synthesis is because like well I don't understand what it does it do, it doesn't produce uh, predictable results is not correct it just doesn't because you haven't spent enough time with it exactly yeah. uh, a person hasn't spent enough time with it where I mean the same thing could be said for the, the very beginning you know sitting a friend down in front of uh, an analog subtractive like there's too many knobs on yeah, this I don't understand yeah. what it does how do you know what to do like 
you experiment. You can yeah. read a manual too, but ultimately it comes down to and experimentation. Ulti- and ultimately that's what the mini mode achieved was it simplified yeah. something, you know, in, into that, you know, it kind of crystallized it into that thing. Yeah. But I mean Wendy Carlos and the one other another factor of it though, the one other factor of it in addition to it being easy to use is classic sounds and records were made with it. Yeah. And that that yeah. can't be ignored because yeah. why why is the Fender Stratocaster that was released in 1954 still the most popular style of guitar yeah. to today? Yeah, I mean, there's no reason it should be. I mean, they've got guitars with fancier gadgets and stuff. It has a good tone and it's been used on so many records. It's easy to use. It's the same things that we would say about the mini boat. Yeah. I was, there's lots yeah. of people in the in the chat talking about like FM saying, you know, it's it's simple uh, and it's it is fairly straightforward and it, and it is. It's just different. But as uh, yeah. I'm kind of I'm going to paraphrase a quote from somebody. So I I heard this from Manny Fernandez and it's a Wendy Carlos quote and she says with digital synth, and I'm paraphrasing completely here, but it says with digital synthesis, you can create anything. But the downside is you have to create everything, and it's yeah. it's because you with with subtractive synthesis, you start off with a complex waveform, and you're you're shaping it, you're stripping things away, and you're shaping it. With with digital synthesis, you're starting off pr- primarily with you know a simple waveform, and you're going to have to add things to it, and and you know so yeah. it's you have to create all this stuff. So I thought that was a very that was a very nice kind of simple simplified way of kind of explaining the the difference. Absolutely. There. When I was doing my seminars uh, in school for the, the six form music tech about analog synthesis, my basic my basic starting point was. All of these different components in an analog synthesizer, they essentially, and we'll go back to a, a word here, they model what is happening in an acoustic sound. You have something which generates yeah. the actual noise. You have something which then determines the, the pitch of that noise. You have something that determines the amplitude, the loudness of that noise. You have something which determines the timbre, its brightness, its dullness. You have something which determines how that sound changes over time, whether it's a very quick sound, whether it's a very long, slow sound. And they're all, in their own way, modelling what happens in an acoustic sound. Yeah. The process. But in, a, in electronics. And, and for that reason, the analogue system is quite easy to grasp once you know what each of these different components is actually doing. Mm. And, and yet when you go back to something like the dx7 that has that those components built into it yeah but it's that initial sound generating element where the complexity lies you know that the, the real the real difficulty lies in getting these operators to interact with each other and change over time to do what you want it to do that's the battle Whereas in a, in a in an analog subtractive synth, it, it's relatively straightforward. Yeah. And I, and I, I think Chris, you sort of hinted at it that that it's a it's a problem with 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 interface more than it is with concept. Uh, I think, which is why still here we are, countless decades after the DX7 was produced, there's people still sitting there hankering for a DX7 with an interface that's. Yeah, <laughs> intuitive. Well, that's intu- that yeah. Where you go, oh, I can see what it's doing. I understand what it's doing now. Yeah. Whereas when you when you're trying to edit it through a a keyhole, yeah, it, it's like yeah. it's like oh. painting a corridor through the letterbox. Yeah, it very much is that. And you know, the thing with with FM, you know, and I, yes, all right, I get, I get that that I'm a, I'm a fanboy, um, but once you get it. And it, it takes a little longer to get, but once you get it, it does become a lot easier. Once you understand the re- you know the relationship between the operators, and and how you, know, it's one of those things that you really do benefit from getting a book or a manual, and sitting down and reading through it before you even touch the thing, to just basically understand the concept because. I bet if you took somebody who'd never used any synthesizer ever and stuck them in front of 
uh, you know, a, a, a complex analog synth and a, and a DX7, that they would probably get decent sounds out of it in similar amounts of time. Because, but the problem we all have as as synthesists is that we all kind of got into it with subtractive analog synthesis, and we mm-hmm. you have to kind of unlearn stuff, particularly with FM. You have to unlearn, you know, things go in reverse sometimes, and, and it's 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 different. I, I think that's a problem that, that like we you've got to unlearn things when you get on an FM synth. It, it, it the, the mistake of thinking that the operators are your oscillators mm. and it, 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 I think that's the only problem with it I think you're totally right if you started off on both you might have a, a much more equal split on the preference because one of the it, things that helped me understand FM synthesis and you, you said that about you know people mixing up operators and oscillators the thing that helped me kind of really get it was when somebody said an operator is 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 a is not an equivalent of an oscillator it's the equivalent of a synthesizer because an operator (laughs) contains the waveform and the envelope generators and all this so it's it's you're like you know on a six op fm synth you're Mm. you've got six synthesizers that can then interact with each other rather than just six oscillators which is not just six oscillators so again it's that kind of myth that sits behind coming coming back to that you know that proposition of like you know sending them down like it, it the mini moog would would be much quicker to access because of the hardware but if if we changed the game on it and said here's a midi controller you get the arturia mini moog and the arturia dx7 and its interface which is radically different than mm-hmm. programming on a hardware dx7 uh, yeah i think you would get a lot closer and and um I've never had a DX7, but I've got um, the Arturia DX7, and I've had Dex in the past, and mm-hmm. I've, I've spent time programming on both of them, and it really opens it up much easier, yeah. even if you don't have anybody to tell you what to do, to be able to intuit what's happening with it through the interface. As you guys have been saying already, it reduced the amount of like that time where you're just making nothing but terrible sounds. Like yeah. you get, you get <laughs> to sounds much quicker, maybe not as quick as, you know, the, the interface of a mini mode, but still it speeds it up quite a bit. And so, yeah, uh, th- today, uh, you know, going back to, was it Korg that had showed? I don't, I don't think it was Yama. Was it Korg Robbie that had showed that the uh, op six. in the you know, op six? Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, where people what are like, "What? What's? What is this?" Like, was everybody was really interested. Yeah. But of course, I think I think even better than that would be um, the Essence FM mm-hmm. and its kind of interface. The, the only problem is that they have it in a that little rack mount thing. Yeah, exactly. If they could, as they've teased, put in a keyboard. I hope not a stripped down one like they were saying. Mm-hmm. But if they put um, and maybe do a deluxe one that was, uh, you know, we've they've already been talking about it here, but maybe expand it out to a op, yeah, and put it in a nice keyboard form where you got a big touch screen. Mm-hmm. Imagine if it was put out on a, a large like iPad style screen. Yeah, yeah. You didn't have much other controls, but now you're drawing in envelopes and you're messing with operators. That would I'm be in. really interesting yeah, to see what, what would happen with FM if they would have. Uh, if it if that would produce a lot more interest yeah. for it, and then maybe other atom manufacturers would have a go at, can we make a better interface for FM synthesis? I mean, I've just been sat here thinking, and I thought, well, yeah, we 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 talked about the uh, the mini Moog and and how it was this you know massively influential, and it, it's clearly you know it's the winner um, in, in this debate uh, as probably the biggest game changer, um, but the mini Moog was the result of a number of decades of huge complex unfathomably difficult to use electronic instruments whether it was you know whether it was moog modulars or previous you know, other things they these were big university based pieces of equipment that only the guys in the lab coats with the pocket protectors understood how to work Bob's genius was to take that and get it down and down and down into a keyboard synthesizer that could cut it on stage with everyone else and was simple to understand, 
got at, you know got your results really quickly and that was and that was it and then everything else has kind of gone from there so maybe fm synthesis which had a similar start you know in laboratories in the 60s and then developed into the synthesizer maybe we're still waiting for that one synthesizer that brings all of that together into the perfect kind of classic fm synth you know maybe the dx7 is a step C1? towards that yeah. C1, is it called C1? Well, that, that that seems to be the one that moving in that that direction. Yeah, but it's just you know we 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 need to have a way to control FM synthesis and other types of synthesis as well, like modelling, in a way that is um, easy to understand, intuitive, gets instant results, like the Mini Moog did. The Mini Moog was all of that. You know, it it produced. You, you could instantly get a sound. You could instantly make it sound like something else. You could make it, you know, give it motion and, and all this kind of stuff. And, but it was there, and maybe we're still a way off from getting, yeah, you know, the 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 FM mini Moog. Uh, I'm using that as a descriptor, not as a yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know the, the, but that thing. What is the science behind uh, and the limitation on operators? Why is there is some sense, but like. Didn't the DX have like a set amount of operators? It wasn't like unlimited, was it? It wasn't. No, it wasn't unlimited. So you had um, two op, four op, and six op, and then ultimately eight op. So yeah. the FS one R, the montage, the Mo well, the, the, the the montage and the Modi X FM engine is the same as the the FS one R's eight operator, and therefore eighty eight yeah. algorithms. But uh, and the configuration of the operators is the algorithm, isn't that's it? That's right. Yeah. So theoretically, you can have as many of those as you need, but of course, you need the computational power to to produce those, and then you know the the ability to com you know combine them in such a way as that they are unique and do something that isn't already done by another configuration. You know. So I'm just har harking back to Chris's idea of this SS Essence FM Super Synth. Which to me looks like a DX1 with a big touch screen, <laughs> uh, and I'm wondering, I'm wondering whether you can just, but the, instead you can just move the operators around in your own algorithms. Wow, well, well that's 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 Essence FM, that's Codemos Essence FM, because yeah. it has six operators, but they're all freely configurable, so you can create yeah, any right. algorithm that right. you you know. I, I don't know what the there must be a. Uh, a limit, a, you know, a finite limit of combinations, but you can yeah. have as many as you like, and you can freely assign them. Whereas with the Yamaha, the yeah. Yamaha version was said, "Look, you know, these are your best choices. These will get you the broadest range of sounds. So we're going to limit it and do it that way." Right. Yeah. Okay. The other synthesizer that's kind of pushing the envelope. <laughs> <Which is fun. laughs> yeah. Um <laughs> would be like the quantum and iridium because at, now I, I've played the quantum several times um, and I have not programmed on it. So I do not, I don't know what the, the FM part of it, how easily it is to use if it's as easy as the, what the SS essence FM looks like or not. But uh, you have to say it's pretty remarkable in that it's, it covers so much ground where you have, um, you know, granular sampling type stuff, um, resonators, wavetables, virtual analog. I mean, everything is in there at mm. least that's available to you to to create sounds, and it's quite. Um, uh, so looks like Wagyu has uh, the quantum, and he, uh, talking about the FM kernel. So it, it's a pretty interesting thing to see uh, that this is still uh, all these you know somewhat esoteric styles of synthesis are being put in one of the flagship synthesizers, you know, one of the great, mm. one of the greats of our time right now of 2020. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, I was just trying to look at what else there was in there. And now my browser seems to have uh, balked. Um, <laughs> but well, yeah. I, I think the only place to go from here is into string theory after this yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> contemplating the, the, the way that our 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 existence is nothing but uh waveforms of energy and time and <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh, what's happened to my my browser has just decided to go <laughs> okay well i can't scroll through and find out what else was was on that list but i just thought um 
there was a really good range of stuff on there and so uh, you know some of it i could see where it was coming from others i wasn't so sure um there was some good debate in there very and, and of course as we've come to expect from our group um lots of very reasoned debate um and yeah, yeah there was one or two little snidey remarks there but we should we shall skate over those <laughs> it was a cracking poll though it, I, well i just kind of pulled it out of my backside because i thought i don't know what to ask and i just thought what do i yeah what what do i cogitate you know when i'm trying to get to sleep at night i think you know well, the future of synthesis that's how boring i am you see um so yeah it's um it's interesting so we so it might be also good to say we do have a poll question for next week yes it's already done and so that will be out on Monday and also uh, coming next Sunday, a uh, special guest will be Michael Whalen. So be sure to tune in. Lightning for that. fingers. Yeah. Him and his, yeah, that's, that's going to be, I'm really looking forward to that one. Not that we don't, you know, look forward to our other guests, Andrew. <laughs> Just get that in there. Yes, absolutely. Michael Whalen next week. Um, if, if you don't know, yeah, yeah, I'm digging, I'm going off. Um, if you don't know Michael, um, go and check his work. Yeah, he's he's an active member on the group as well, um, and he's recently had a feature done on him by Cherry Audio because he um, advocated for their their DCO whatever it was called, um, their Juno Six or whatever it yeah. was Juno Sixty clone thing. Um, so there's an interview with him on there. Um, can I have I got dug myself out of that hole? Um, right, um, Andrew. Thank you ever so much for joining us this week. Um, oh, my pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Good. Um, what have you got? Uh, have you got anything coming up in the pipeline that's interesting you want to tell us about? Uh, coming up in the pipeline, um, I did. I did a track that's for an in memoriam album, and very soon that is going to go live on Bandcamp. And okay. I'm quite looking forward to that happening. Uh, a, a, a fairly significant friend. Uh, mm. Of a lot of people here in Sheffield uh, passed away in in May. I remember you saying. And that. yeah, and uh, and this this album's it's, it, it's nearing completion. There's there's some fairly significant contributors in to, to it. Uh, so that that's not coming. That's not me doing anything now. I've done my bit, and somebody else is doing it. But when when that actually gets the thumbs up that this is all all completed and mastered and up on Bandcamp. I shall be contacting various people to, to say, please put this out there because we'd like mm. as many people to hear it. Well, feel free uh, it to share for, it on our group. Yeah, it was for, for, for a guy called Paul Bauer who was, who was very significant to, to a lot of us. Uh, other than that, I, I'm just, I've just got scheduled in two hours a day to keep learning the bloody MPC until I know what to do with the blasted <laughs> things. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, Chris, what have you got lined up for this week? Anything interesting? Yeah, yeah. Uh... So just to tell everybody uh, below in the uh, description box of this live stream has links to everybody's uh, channels. Um, I've got a, a piece coming out that's like 13 and a half minutes long. And I started it in somewhat experimental mode uh, as a piece to show off a bunch of the Prophet 6 presets that I've made. But it's really kind of involved into its own thing. And it's it's been very fun. And so it's uh, very dark and kind of Halloween-ish almost. Um, and then after I had finished the song, uh, I went and like tried to stitch together a, a video for it, and it's uh, absolutely horrendous. So <laughs> you should you should watch. Close, close your eyes and listen to the song for the uh, great uh, ethereal darkness <laughs> and watch the video if you want to have a bit of fun. Although the video, like what I was trying to go for, was a bit of... Uh, a, a very abstract telling of the hero's journey uh, as, you know, it, as referenced by uh, like Joseph Campbell and mm -hmm. his work. So um, kind of a lot of dealing with darkness in your life kind of stuff. And so hopefully the music goes along with that. And it has a lot of different changes in the music. And I'm hoping people will enjoy that. It was it was fun for me. So I'm glad cool. to kind of get it out. Excellent. Good stuff. Ben. No. Um I've spent two days solid in the studio here and I've learned so much. Uh, I've been like sending MIDI down networks. I've been oh, yes. sending things everywhere, rooting for, I don't know, if... God knows what, but for the sake of it. But uh, 
Yeah, I, I'll be carrying on with that, really, but I'm making good progress. And I, I think I said originally that I'd have it done in two days. I, I was very much <laughs> mistaken with that. <laughs> uh, I could have had it done in half a day. So do you know, I probably still have had it as effective as it is now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you sent me and Chris a um, a video clip the other day, which I thought was very <clears throat> excuse me very cool about you um, how you control the power supply to your equipment in your studio. And I'm I'm just going to ask you, is the sound you're hearing yeah, my voice yeah. now is yeah. only in the headphones? Yeah, you can't hear oh, it. Oh, that's because that's I thought, wouldn't it be great if I just said, Alexa, studio off, and then boom, Ben just goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was brilliant. But that, yeah. I, to be honest, I've, I have been looking at um, smart plugs. I'm just a bit wary of um, the the kind of the, when, it, when you say Alexa, studio on, all of that gear powering up at the same time just scares me a little i don't know i don't know yeah I, I, I don't know what happens with mine but it tends to trickle across all right but, yeah yeah uh, i don't know why yeah. but uh yeah I, I think it's great yeah you just walk in you're ready for working That's straight it. away yeah know? and i'm particularly lazy so it suits me <laughs> no i think it's great because <laughs> every morning i come in and i have to I, I try not to leave too much plugged in apart from the essential stuff um, so I have to kind of crawl under my desk and plug a couple of things in. And if I want to use this stuff over here, I, I have to, um, I, I just realized I'm gesturing and you can't see me on camera. But if I have to use this stuff, that comes off one power supply and then this comes off another power supply. Um, so I have to kind of crawl around. It would just be great to, to sort of say, Alexa, Yamaha rig on. And, oh, and, yeah. and it would come up. Yeah, you could be, do all that. Yeah. yeah. So, and because uh, Amazon are knocking out the, the 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 previous generation of the Echo Dots for, for for very little money, I thought oh, I'll just get one of those because I don't, you know, I wouldn't use it for anything else other than that. But then again, I'm always worried about you know them bloody listening into all my conversations, what have you. Yeah, that will happen. Yeah. Tomorrow, I'll get loads of uh, sponsored adverts about uh, mini mini mugs and stuff. Yeah. Well, tomorrow. that's not too bad, I suppose. It could be yeah. worse. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, um, I've <laughs> I've got an interesting job this week because um, I just got one of these, which is um, the IK Multimedia yeah. Arc Three, and this is the this is the microphone, and then of course you have the software to go along with it. Um, so I'm going to be calibrating my little space here uh, based on my speakers, um, but you have to do like twenty one different measurements, seven. Uh, yes below ear level seven at ear level and seven at above ear level yeah and do it's, all of that it's pretty easy to do yeah it's a i i'm a recent uh user of it and uh, that whole process is very easy it walks you through it uh it's 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 quite a good product and it's helping my like very poor monitoring situation so yeah that's i what... think you're gonna like it yeah i hope so so yeah that that's um that's on my plan, and and trying to relax. I did a a thing that I can't talk about at the week. Well, two days ago, uh, I did a recording session, and I had to do it remotely in here, and it was really, um, uh, what's the word? It it was stressful, very stressful. Um, so I'm just kind of making the most of not being stressed as I have been for the last week. Um, but hopefully, I'll be able to talk about it fairly soon because it was a really fun thing to do, um, and yeah. So anyway, um, that's it. Hey, uh, yeah. Before before we close out, let's uh, just a few plugs. So first of mm. all, I don't know if we got. Uh, do, yeah, I think I think Robbie, you put um, Andy's link in the. Um, yep. Yeah. The description. It is. So that's there. Check out his oh. channel. Also on Bandcamp. A little bit there is there. Um, do check it out. <laughs> yeah, it's great though. Also. Uh, uh, Aaron Russell, which is imperfect in our chat room, he has a new album out that is very cool and very vibey and very perfect for Halloween week. Uh, mm -hmm. Deals with some like cool kind of horror soundtrack stuff that um, I'm looking forward to diving in. And uh, also, uh, if I think everybody, pretty much everybody in our chat room already knows about Randy's show, mm -hmm. and which Andy is a regular member on, yep. but they had a great discussion last week. Uh, or, or sorry, this last yesterday uh, about analog versus digital. That mm -hmm. was very fun. Uh, they've had some very notable guests on there. 
<laughs> well, I think the only one yeah, that has the only one in this group be... here that hasn't been on is Ben. Yeah. I'm fine with that. Yeah, come on, Ramsey, sort that out. Get 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 Ben yeah, on. Come on, Ramsey, sort it out. Get he doesn't ben do on. anything on a Saturday I'm afternoon. Ramsey gave him the offended. invitation. That's true. He, he gave him the invitation <laughs> on oh, the network. Oh, right. He Sorry. gave a yeah. yeah. Uh, so so it's on you, the, Ben. Uh, I'm not getting up at three o'clock in the morning. Can do it's long. not on at three o'clock <laughs> in the morning. It's three o'clock <laughs> in the afternoon <laughs> for you. Two, two o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. You daft. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was in Australia. He yeah, is. Yeah. yeah, but you're not. All oh, right. Oh, all right. I, okay. Yeah. I had to get up a little bit early, but you won't. Yeah. You see. <laughs> all right. Uh, maybe. It's still Too getting up early. Ben. Too many it, that, It's still getting up early at three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> oh, fair enough. <laughs> is this the longest show we've ever done? It's getting there, and my my <laughs> bladder oh, God, is telling me it is. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the last yeah. thing we should end with is an apology to to Andy. <laughs> <laughs> nothing to apologize to me honestly and i'm just glad that so many people turned up at the right time um, un <laughs> unlike this guy here no what am i doing this guy here who messages me at 10 to 7 saying are we doing a show and i'm like yeah but not in an hour oh, yeah. despite him <laughs> despite him posting my my video and 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 a link to say yeah don't forget everyone we're on an hour later in the u.s <laughs> oh dear. Anyway, everything will be back to normal next. Go and sort your clocks, Ben. Yeah. Everything, everything will be back to normal. Go and sort your clocks out. Right, reconnection successful. Am I still going out? This is really weird. Oh wow, what's going on? Oh, so that just went. <laughs> well, I don't know if this is, um... yes it is, we're, we're still streaming. Okay, so yeah, I can see that the stream is still going. I, I guess everybody has left. Um, uh, is anybody there? Um, I'm not even sure that's connected. That's really strange. But hey, look, um, I, I'm honestly sorry that I don't quite know what happened there. All I've got right now is this, um, frozen in time, uh, all of our guests. Um, and I seem to be the only one here. And um, the Skype call has dropped. And uh, I just don't know what happened there. I really don't. Um, so I'm just going to carry on uh, and just kind of end the show properly so that we have something uh that's that's usable um listen everyone um thank you ever so much for um for joining us i i, I apologize terribly for uh what's just happened in terms of the technical issues i hope that doesn't put you off too much and we'll be back same time same place next week uh 8 p.m uk time and of course for those of you living in the us you change your clocks um, next Sunday morning so the the time difference will be back to normal so it'll be 12 p.m uh, on the uh, west coast and 3 p.m on the east coast and uh, so hopefully everybody will be back in in synchronization anyway um thanks ever so much for what has been a very long and um, fun show to do uh, really good conversations and I uh, hope you enjoyed that we will see you same time same place next week and um, it kind of yeah it's slightly disappointing because I was just going to uh, end the show um, uh, with a with a moment's silence for the the legend that is Chris Huggett who uh, passed away today so thanks ever so much for watching and uh, God bless you Chris take care speak to you soon bye bye